Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> okay, before we uh, move on to public comment, I just want to uh, welcome our newest member, Jeff Reese. Familiar, a new Morning. familiar face for us. Okay, public comments. Um, Mary Kerr, would you like to speak now? Yes, please. Good morning, commissioners, and welcome, Mr. Reese. Thank you. Um, I wanted to... Uh, uh, oh, I should say I'm from Southern Kent Island. I know you all like to know where we come from. And uh, also, I am uh, the co-chair of the newly structured Kent Island Defense League, PAC, uh, which just started to get itself back together again a couple months ago. Um, I, I was very interested a couple of months ago when you were talking about McDonald's to have uh, Mr. Waterman say that uh, it didn't matter how many letters he got on a subject, it didn't matter what his personal views were, his only concern was what the law said and how to implement it. Um, I'm sure you all received this when you first joined the Planning Commission, which is the state's Article 66B, Planning Commission Duties and Responsibilities. On page 17, it says, the primary responsibility of the Planning Commission, the primary responsibility of the Planning Commission is to implement the vision outlined in the comprehensive plan. I think that's pretty clear. The item that you are going to discuss, excuse me, later on today, comprehensive plan and opportunities for achieving smart growth. Every single one of these seven items will weaken the plan. It will not strengthen it. I sat on the Planning Commission when the plan was being written, so I do have some familiarity with it. And I can, I would be, if someone can tell me how any of these strengthen a specific goal or objective of the plan, I would be very surprised. They tend to weaken it. And I hope you take your primary responsibility seriously when moving forward on this. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Ms. Kerr, can you please, is it Kerr or Kerr? Pardon me? Is it Kerr or Kerr? Oh, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the correct pronunciation, because it is Scottish, is Kerr. But it's a losing battle. <laughs> Please read the quote again from Article 66. Oh, sure. Uh, it's on page 17. Yes, ma'am. Remember, the primary responsibility of the Planning Commission is to implement the vision outlined in the comprehensive Thank plan. Thank you very much. Before you go, where is the conflict between that and my comment that doesn't matter what my personal feeling is, that we need to follow what's in the law? I'm sorry, Barry. You, you indicated uh, that... I assume that you had some issue with the, my comment that doesn't matter what I think or whatever. No, I was walks. I was thrilled to death with what you said. Oh. I just want you to carry it through. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Ms. Thank Care. you. Ms. Kerr? Yes. Um, what group do you represent again? The Kent Island Defense League, PAC. That's an organization that's been around for a while. Uh, a couple of members of the organization ended up on the commissioners, on the planning commissioners, and the organization sort of fell apart. And uh, the people on Ken Island literally feel that they do not have a voice. The eight municipalities have their own governmental structure. They can say what they want. They can try to get what they want. Kent Island is left to the mercy of elected and appointed officials who always don't understand Kent Island issues. And quite frankly, some of the people feel don't really care about Kent Island issues. Thank you. Uh, any other public comment? Okay, we're going to close public comment and move on to uh, review of minutes.
You need a motion, Mr. Chair. Unless there's any changes, we'd be happy to have a motion to approve. I move to accept the minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Minutes are approved. Extension requests. Good morning, Commissioners. The extension request for this morning is Fisherman's Village Major Site Plan 051003 0001-C. Uh, I've provided the memo as requested uh, regarding the history of the project and this was originally a, a proposed mixed-use development that would be of uh, 19,266 square feet for a banquet facility and approximately 9,700 square feet for a commercial retail building. Uh, this was originally submitted back in March of 2010, went through a couple of stack reviews and then was granted conditional approval by the Planning Commission in June of 2010. Uh, they had a six-month uh, period that expired on December 2010 and they received uh, another conditional six-month approval uh, in January and then they that was to expire in July of 2011. The applicant was again granted another six-month extension in January 12, uh, 2012 and then another six-month extension until July 2012, at which time they requested a one-year extension, and that expires mm -hmm. today. And I believe the <coughs> applicant's representatives here to discuss their request. Um, as indicated in the letter, uh, the Schultz family is still trying to make this project a reality. Uh, financing is a big issue with uh, today's uh, regulations and, and the banking uh, status. Um, Jody's asking for another six months. As about a month ago, we did have an update meeting with planning and zoning, so they are actively trying to uh, make this project a reality. Uh, it's just tough right now to secure the financing. And uh, Jody's supposed to be here, so um, if you want to ask him pertinent questions, he'll six be Six months? Here. Is that what six months, I believe, is what you granted on the Bay East project. So. Mr. Davis, where is this property located? It's... Um, immediately adjacent to the fisherman's crab deck between there and the narrows restaurant it's a uh, yacht sales repair building. facility right now and they were going to they were going to demolish the existing building and develop a uh, banquet facility called fisherman's village you know what we might need to do at some point tom is um <clears throat> as uh, what i remember of this project it seems like a pretty nice project mm -hmm. But as we keep getting these extensions, <coughs> we get new planning commission members, mm -hmm. and they really don't even know the project. Right. So at the next meeting, um, if you get your extension, the next time if you have to come for an extension, it might want to review the project uh, um, that's reasonable. in, in yep. detail. Mm -hmm. Is there any public comment on this extension? Okay. I move that we grant a six-month extension to Fisherman's Village 051003 0001-C. Second. Any discussion? I'm going to um, agree. However, this is getting really old. We had this discussion last month about how often we keep giving these extensions. So I'm, I'm not going to vote against it, but I just want to go on record as this is really getting old. I I don't uh, I don't think any of us disagree with that, but I do think we need to take into account the, the economic realities that have happened in the last five or six years, which have drug out a lot of stuff far beyond, particularly commercial stuff. Once uh, again, I think, um, you know, I don't think anyone on the commission but me has probably seen a, a plat on this to, to any detail and had it explained. So... Um, it might be something to, to review if you need to. Hopefully you won't. And this isn't as old as some of the ones we've seen before. Honestly, I probably wouldn't object, but this is getting kind of old. Either they're not estimating correctly or our limits are such that we can't give them initially more time. I don't know what it is, but it feels like we waste time doing this, and we've never said no, so... I think it might be helpful for these ones that lay around for a long time to know whether there's been any change in the law since the original approval was granted. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
for example, uh, the, one, you know, the one that comes to mind immediately is stormwater management, but, um, and whether there's some escape from new requirements by granting an extension. <coughs> this project, this one has this project now. addressed the stormwater management's uh, current law. Here's Jody. <laughs> Having a discussion about the continued request for extensions. So. Just to frame we, that properly, we we're made having a that after right? we had a motion and a second yeah, they, to give you a six month yeah, extension. Yeah. So unless someone has a question for Mr. Schultz, um, all oh, those in I, favor? I suppose I do. Six months. I, should be. I mean, we're still trying to secure some tenants. Financing is. is um, I just wonder if six. You know. Oh, he called for a vote. Go. I know. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. The, the planning commission brings up valid points and. Did have, we did provide a list of the background projects and the projects requesting extensions that was put on your agenda as follow up to last month's meeting requesting that information. Um, but we could go through each of those or make sure a presentation is done on some of those to make sure all the planning commission members feel comfortable with the information that's provided. So I, we'll I think, start yeah, I just think, um, you know, we have a lot of new faces on the yes. planning commission. And as these properties come up again, it just, I think it's important to do it as they come up. To, to familiarize everyone with what's going on. I mean, you know, I think this project is a great project, and, um, but I don't think anyone else, you know, knows the details of it. Okay, I'm unclear who voted last time. So all those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, next, um, legal and legislative updates. Good morning, Mr. Todd. Good morning, good morning. <coughs> Chairman Waterman, Planning Commission members, Jeffrey, welcome aboard. Thank you, Mr. Tom. <clears throat> so I just wanted to go over a few ordinances that have been introduced and voted on since the last time I was here. County Ordinance 1308, which is uh, an act permitting, an act concerning permitted use in light industrial highway services zoning district in Queen Anne's County was introduced on the 9th, which was this Tuesday. County Ordinance 1310, an act concerning a rezoning request for 14.43 plus or minus acres and um, price was introduced as well. County Ordinance 1316, which is an act concerning the critical area for designation of intensely developed area IDA under the Queen Anne's County uh, Chesapeake Bay Critical Area Act was introduced as well. And this came from staff here concerning with, based on some concerns we had with uh, IDA development in two of our business parks. Then they voted on two, voted unanimously on, on two ordinances, County Ordinance 1317 and County Ordinance 1318. 1317 was an act concerning the revisions of Chapter 11, the Code of Public Laws, Queen Anne's County for Construction Regulation Electrical Examiners, and 1318 was an act concerning the real property tax credit for certain businesses um, under Section 510.4 of the Code of Public Laws of Queen Anne's County. What this one did is it basically it decreased the number of employees needed from 25 to 12 to receive uh, tax credits uh, based on investments made in businesses. So that was legislation that we actually had put in place at the state level. Then we had to change the ordinance to reflect it. And then the final ordinance today is 1319 was introduced. And this is the um, Act Concerning Animal C Control and Animal Services in Queen Anne's County. There'll be a hearing on this and the other ones that were introduced at the next meeting. And the, um, the gist of this one is when the commissioners first came into office, they tasked us with looking at ways to re reduce government functions that are, should be, in some opinion, non-governmental. Animal services is one of those. We're one of the few counties in the state that actually has the adoption and the control part under the same roof. A lot of, a lot of different counties will have the adoption either through a, a nonprofit such as the SPCA or the Humane Society. So we followed that example and we are looking to contract with a nonprofit to run the adoption and then we will move the enforcement and the animal control end under the Sheriff's Department. And in order to do that, we needed to change, uh, change Title IX, which is the title in the county that controls animal services or that under, animal services fall under. So there'll be a hearing on that one as well. Uh, other updates, we did have a uh, informational community meeting last night here in this room concerning the new county complex, which would be the planning and zoning building, state's attorney and election board at the Schaefer property. Uh, we do plan on submitting a con con concept plan to the town planning commission for the August hearing, but we did have 
you know, two hours of comment on it. So it was, it was good to get it out in front of them. And we are going to take some of their suggestions back and see what we can do. So any questions? Uh, my only comment is that the courthouse project not be held hostage to the county's project. Well, they're both county projects, Chris. You get my point. I, I get it every time you bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> At the very least, they should go simultaneously, in my opinion. At the very least. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, as far as legal items, I really didn't have any additional updates. Chris? Um, no, uh, well, uh, the only uh, new item that I can think of is that we filed, uh, I have on behalf of the county filed a uh, request with the circuit court that uh, judgment be entered against um, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson uh, down on um, Y River Road, um, which would reduce the civil fines in the amount of $93,700 uh, to a judgment against them for their failure to comply with a court order regarding a shoreline restoration uh, requirement uh, by both, or I should say, not by both, but <coughs> emanating from the Corps of Engineers, the Maryland Department of the Environment, and the county. Um, and that's being opposed by the Johnsons, so we'll see. It would be the largest fine ever imposed by the county and certainly reducing it to judgment would be a first too so we'll see why is it so high mr Drummond? is it interest has it been no um it's been 40 years in the making yeah well aside because from the fact that it's been 40 years in the making uh about a year ago the circuit court um in in the context of a contempt proceeding for the johnson's failure to comply with uh their, ob their obligation to remove fill that they had put illegally into the Y River uh, imposed um, a fine of $100 a day for every day that they were not complying with the court order. <coughs> um, and that actually is in three components, uh, $100 a day for n failure to remediate the illegal fill into the Y River. That's the 93000 seven or eight hundred dollars uh, and then there's two other components for their failure to get permits for various th various construction activities on the property that d didn't have county permits so the total grand total is about two hundred and sixty some thousand dollars uh, we've only asked for the fines to be reduced to judgment on the shoreline restoration project that has not been completed as required because they have submitted applications for permits on the other issues. They haven't been issued because it's the policy of planning and zoning not to issue any permits until all um, unpermitted activities uh, have been remediated. So they have complied, but we can't issue the permits because they haven't finished the shoreline restoration as required <coughs> under a consent agreement with the Corps and MDE which the county has fallen heir to enforcing. And that would be very complicated to explain, but we're in a position, by we I mean the county, to enforce the Johnson's agreements with the federal government and the state government. And we allege that they haven't done it properly. I was zoning inspector in 73 and 74. This was an ongoing thing in 1973 and 1974. So you can see it is 40 years old and nobody complied then and doesn't look like anybody wants to comply now. What, what, what I will say is this office is pushing the issue on this enforcement action. This is the, um, we're, we're pushing it at the court. We're staying on top of it. Um, we are, and, and we find ourselves being the, the enforcement arm of MDE and Army Corps of Engineers in this case. Um, and we're doing it by ourselves. You know, that, that has been a big part of the issue. Um, but we have been in court with, with this specific instance um, probably six times in the last year. The last couple of years, but yeah. Um, so we, we are going to bring this to, to, to completion. And that's notwithstanding 
my direct conversations on two occasions with the Attorney General of the State of Maryland. Yes. Yes, we've tried those avenues as well. <laughs> Um, thank you. In, in addition, um, just an update. The Cloisters uh, project that the Planning Commission uh, reviewed two different plans, the 240 plan, the 273 plan, um, that final approval had been appealed, and it looks like it's set for a tentative date uh, before the Board of Appeals of August 14th. Um, so advertising, uh, if that date sticks, it'll be advertised and posted. Um, Merrick Farm, the uh, major sand and gravel pit that the Planning Commission reviewed and made a recommendation on last month is uh, being reviewed and we still need to set a date for that to go to before the Board of Appeals. But that should probably be moving forward to the Board of Appeals in the next uh, 30 days. So. All right. Since the next item on the agenda is a public hearing, do we have to wait? Probably should. We we do have a few mis uh, two miscellaneous staff items. Let's uh, take them then. Yeah, one, either one. The miscellaneous item that uh, I would I'm going to be talking about real quick here is you requested some information on all the conditionally approved items and projects that you continue to hear uh, for extension requests. At this, it's at the back, very back of your packet. Uh, this is something that Barbara puts together uh, and continually updates and sends around to all of us. And it's got all the projects, which are not as many projects, maybe as it would seem when you're granting the extensions. And of course, the ones that are in litigation are not being ones that you're being granted extensions. So essentially, the ones that are still active and uh, that you have seen recently, obviously, today, Fisherman's Village. And you can see that uh, in Bay East, they were, they were in here just recently, back in May, for their uh, <coughs> six-month extension. And Barbara puts on here a notice of when she needs to send out a reminder. So, um, excuse me, the Holiday Inn Express, the McKinney Forest, which would be coming back here. I believe that would be in September. And of course, the last two projects which are on the agenda for today, but projects that you've seen. So it's actually a short list, but it seems like a lot of work that you're continuing to have to do over and over. So uh, duly noted that it would be useful to present these projects in, a, in an abbreviated form again at the time that these would be going for uh, another extension to update you and apprise you of what the project is, since many of you have not seen any of these. Uh, so that, that will be something that we'll, we'll put together, an abbreviated staff report, <coughs> and certainly can have the applicant do a, do a presentation so you are understanding where they are and they hopefully can explain to all of us you know, the, the complications that they are facing in today's economic times. Uh, just, just to be clear, Let's make sure the applicants understand that this is just to familiarize us with yes. the project, not a whole dog and pony no. show. Absolutely. Abbreviated. Yes, very abbreviated. Yes. Yes. Is this only a list of ones that re require extension requests or, or have asked for extension requests? These are, th these are the conditionally approved projects that we have right now. This is, this is, this is all of them. Where's Cloisters? That's finally approved by us. Oh, it? so the, okay. Right. Okay, that's it. Any questions? Thanks, Howard. Okay. Thank you. We have time for one more? You, you'll have to dig through the, to the back of your packet for this one, too. Rob Gunter Planner here. This morning, I am presenting to you the department's annual report which we are required to submit to MDP every year. Simply a report that contains information regarding development, permitting, and planning related activities within our department within the calendar year. This one is for 2012. Uh, the form of this document this year is substantially different. In years past, it's been much more like a book. MD MDP provided us a template this year of just the required documentation that they wanted. Um, so you can see it's much, much skinnier. Everything from 
the map forward is required to MDE or MDP. I'm sorry. The last three pages are just informational stuff that the department has done anyway that we thought was pertinent to provide to you. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I, I will let you get on your way. Rob, I had one question on there. On the chart for 2012, mm -hmm. I added up all the new lots that were created. Looks yes. to me like it was nine. Is that correct? Yes. Nine lots in the county in a year. Mm -hmm. But yet the some of the um, charts indicate we use a thousand acres. That's because a, a, a house built on a large farm uses up the whole farm theoretically yeah. for development. Yeah, in um, like some of the residential growth tables, there's a, a note that <clears throat> says of the 79 non-PFA units, nine are on parcels that range in size from 20 acres to 254 acres, which will skew those numbers. It's, we're a rural area. It's something we deal with all the time, unfortunately. Okay, so it's my, my point being that it's a bit deceptive yes. when we look at the way the state makes you report this, and, and that's why we're not losing much ground here. Yes, and, and the, that's why we put the asterisk on there because that's not a requirement, but we want to make that known that we really aren't chewing up all that land. Yes, I, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. On um, page nine under section 11, okay. I don't see. Okay. I was wondering, it appears, and I'm not good at annual reports, but it appears that our only answer as county was the thing we consider. The question, by the way, is what is the type of infrastructure affected? By the APFO. Correct. I'm sorry. List each for schools, roads, water, sewers, stormwater, health care, fire, police, or solid waste. And it looks like our answer is roadway intersections. Was that something in addition to those other items or? That, the list for schools, roads, and et cetera is something that was in the question from the template. Mm -hmm. um, our answer was roadway intersections. So that would be in addition to roads? I think that's part of the roads, to be honest with you. I don't know a lot about the APFO. But we do, we do take all those into account, do we not? I, all of this information comes to me. I just plow it in on the board, ah. to be honest with you. <laughs> Where, which one is it? Yes. What is the type of all. Okay. Is there any infrastructure affected? Um, oh. So aren't okay. they all, all of the that are listed affected by our APFO? It, Act, well, Obviously, water, I'm sorry, uh, health care, fire, police, and solid waste would not be affected by APFO. But otherwise, yes, schools, if we had any major subdivisions going through the process, but we, we, do, we at this point in time, we don't. We have some working on it and working towards it. Uh, yes, roadway intersections, water and sewer would be affected. So the answer for 2012 was the only thing other than what was listed that was of consideration to us as a county was roadway intersections. Well, that's asking within the priority funding area. So apparently there was something in the priority funding area that didn't meet the roadway requirements. Of 18 and 552 apparently. That would be the one intersection right. where there is there, and is that's why we put that in there under roadway intersections. Yeah, that would that would be right. We don't have it's an issue. It's potential. It's right. that actually it, it actually issues. affected. Uh, yeah, right. we, we right. don't have a yeah we don't have a hang up with water and sewer. Got it. Thank you. Sorry, I wasn't able to answer. Oh no, that's okay. <laughs> Sorry, I read this. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not kidding. I'm glad you read it. I hate to think I did it for no reason. <laughs> Great chart. Love it. I'm sure you made someone at the state very happy. Any other questions? <laughs> that you All can right. or cannot answer. <laughs> <laughs> I will ship this forward to MDP then. Thank you. Okay, at this time we are going to open the public hearing on the growth allocation petition number 04-12-05-0005-2. C, Eastern Shore Genesis, LLC. All right, Mr. Chairman, the uh, following notice of public hearing uh, <clears throat> appeared on uh, 
uh, two successive occasions, that is on June 28th and July 5th, 2013, in the Record Observer, a publication of general circulation in Queen Anne's County, uh, and in the Bay Times on Wednesday, July 3, 2013, also a publication of general circulation in Queen Anne's County. And I have the um, a certificate of publication from Chesapeake Publishing to that effect. Notice public hearing is as follows. Planning Commission for Queen Anne's County hereby gives notice pursuant <clears throat> to the uh, Code of Public Laws of Queen Anne's County, Chapter 14, Section 14, 1-77B, <clears throat> that will hold a public hearing concerning a growth allocation petition to reclassified land from the limited development area, otherwise known as the LDA, to intense development area, also otherwise known as IDA, for a proposed redevelopment of four properties to construct two new buildings with first floor commercial uses and second floor apartments and an accessory garage. The properties are located between Dundee Avenue and Shamrock Road uh, along Maryland Route 18 in Chester. The property is uh, on tax map 57, parcel 490, 91, 92, and 93. The application was submitted by Eastern Shore Genesis LLC. Uh, represented by its agent Tom Davis of DMS and Associates LLC of Centerville. Uh, petitioner's proposal is made under the procedures of Chapter 14, uh, Article, Subarticle, I'm sorry, Article 15 of the Code. The notice of public hearing goes on to indicate that the application uh, shall be considered by the Planning Commission at a public hearing on Thursday, July 11th, 2013, at 9:15 a.m. It's now 9:16 a.m. In a conference room of the Department of Planning and Zoning 116 Corsival Drive, Centerville, the Planning Commission will receive testimony for or against this application. Following the public hearing, the Planning Commission will make recommendations regarding the uh, growth allocation proposal to the commissioners. Uh, the public hearing is an open meeting, but upon compliance with the Open Meetings Act, a part of all of the meeting may be conducted in closed session. The uh, petition, as well as the development site plan for the subject property and other relevant material, it, uh, is available for review at the Department of Planning and Zoning during regular business hours. The notice of public hearing concludes by indicating that the uh, site is accessible to those with disabilities and gives instructions to those with um, hearing disabilities as how he, they may acquire assistive listening devices. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm satisfied that the notice and procedural prerequisites to convening this public hearing have been satisfied. Thank you, Mr. Drummond. Holly? Okay, great. I would like to point you to the memo that I prepared for this first, just so we understand the situation that we're working with here. It's regarding the this project for growth allocation and the text amendment that was introduced last month, 13-16, uh, and that was uh, regarding IDA in less than 20 acre increments, and we're working on making that easy to do, because uh, right now it's right, you, you're not able to do that. Well, but that's what the Clarity Commission says. That's right. But let's not yeah. d debate that further. <laughs> uh, but basically, right now, uh, you're looking at this for a growth allocation request, and we anticipate that the county commissioners will introduce the text amendment uh, later this, or, or no, they already did, sorry, at the end of last month, and that they would be having a hearing at the end of this month for the text amendment. These projects would uh, hopefully move forward together and very possibly go before the Critical Area Commission sometime uh, early mid-fall uh, for review by them, hopefully approval of the text amendment, and then the growth allocation would then, of course, be able to move forward right uh, right on its heels. So those two things are moving forward in the process. So I wanted you to be apprised of that, separately from the actual can I ask a question based on that? Project, yes. Let's say we approve this today and then the commissioners don't approve the text amendment. Yeah, are we just getting ready to spend a lot of time here discussing this in anticipation for it being approved by the commissioners? The text amendment could end up coming back with some sort of revision. I mean, unless they, if they were to say no, then this wouldn't be able to move forward. And so it's possible, yes. Hopefully unlikely. 
Well, let's be fair. It hasn't the Critical Area Commission, at least the staff, indicated that the amendment that's now proposed, the text amendment that is now proposed, is consistent with yes. the Commission's yes. we, we regulation have, slash policy slash interpretation. <laughs> yes. yes, we we did meet with the Critical Area Commission last week to go over the text oh. amendment, and they do have a good comfort level with it. They've revised it, we've revised it, they've revised it some more, and so we're comfortable with what they want and they're comfortable with what we want. So we have every expectation that it would move forward. We're not the only jurisdiction that's amending, or are we, do you know? As far as I know. With respect to this 20-acre IDA thing. I, I don't know of any other ones that are doing this, no. <coughs> but I would defer to Nancy since she is the critical area person to speak to if, if you need any more information I think we just need to keep in mind we're just one step along yes. a long road yeah this is this is for a recommendation today so okay okay so, since some of you haven't heard this I will go through most of this uh, staff report in its entirety Today, this is uh, for growth allocation for Eastern Shore Genesis, uh, number 0412-05005-C. Uh, the project is located tax map 57, parcels 90, 91, 92, and 93. The parcel size is approximately 1.2 acres. That is a combined area of all four properties. The zoning district is town center and the critical area designation currently is limited development area LDA. Oh, yep. Can you flip the page so they can see it? Um, yeah. I was getting there. No way. This is, no, this is, this says the growth allocation plan on it. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't show the proposed development. So. Right, that's true. Th this is specifically only the growth allocation sheet where it shows all this grade area here. This is specifically what they're requesting. Uh, at the Planning Commission meeting in November 2012, they had come in with uh, this parcel as well, parcel 311 and we're requesting the entirety, I think it was uh, t two or so <coughs> acres, a little over two acres, and the Planning Commission requested that it be reduced to only the parcels that specifically needed the growth allocation, and so <coughs> that has since been taken out. And uh, there will be a small administrative subdivision done to, to tweak some property lines due to some impervious coverage and things like that, but essentially they have reduced it specifically to only the properties that they need as as you had requested and that request is to go from uh, to go from LDA to IDA intensely developed area uh, via this growth allocation request in order to redevelop for parcels that they would be constructing three new buildings totaling 7,100 square feet of first floor commercial with eight second floor commercial apartments there would be associated travelways and parking and they are requesting a favorable recommendation to the county con commissioners today. <coughs> the history of this project, there was a concept plan submitted in May of uh, 2012 last year. There were two stack meetings, and as I said, the Planning Commission meeting uh, last November. And then they resubmitted in May of this year for uh, their growth allocation request, and we had a stack meeting in late May. As you can see, the properties are located uh, off of Maryland 18 here, and here's Shamrock Road, here's Dundee, 5301 is over on this side. So it's kind of sideways, uh, north is actually pointing at me. Sorry. <coughs> Paper issues. Okay. The applicant is proposing a building height of approximately 30 feet, the maximum height and the TC is up to 45 feet. 
the applicant has also calculated the impervious area to be approximately 58% post redevelopment. The TC district would provide um, or permit 80% impervious, thus the proposal is under the permitted percentage. The permitted FAR in TC is 40%, the applicant is proposing 17%. The commercial apartments that are proposed uh, would be one bedroom units and therefore they have to provide parking spaces at one point spaces per unit. The applicant is proposing 94 parking spaces but 88 are required. Uh, the parking will be shared across the interconnected parcels. The applicant is proposing alternative setbacks as permitted under 18.128 D5A of the TC design guidelines. Front setbacks along Dundee <coughs> here would be 15 feet 20 along 18. Uh, the standard front setback is 35 feet. All of the properties will be served by public water and sewer. Regarding environmental features, uh, there are no steep slopes, uh, streams or endangered species or uh, habitat, and it's, this property is also not within the 100-year floodplain. There are some existing trees on the site that will need to be removed for redevelopment, and, but these trees would be need to be replaced per the critical area code, uh, and the project would also have to meet all the landscaping requirements of the county code. And a, and a review of the critical area allocation process. <coughs> the LDA designation allows for the uses permitted by the zoning district, but limits the amount of lot coverage to 15%. So therefore, the 15% makes it very difficult to redevelop the property for commercial uses as desired by our comprehensive and community plans in this area. So growth allocation basically is a provision of the critical area law uh, that would allow for changes such as this. <coughs> the first step the applicant has to take is receiving the concept plan by IU, demonstrating that the proposed uses can be permitted and supported on the property. That was granted back in November. The Planning Commission may also issue technical comments, and one of them obviously was to change the acreage, and they have done that. And once that approval is granted, the applicant has to submit a formal petition, which they did do to the county commissioners, and then that petition is forwarded to, to us, and that is what is before you today. After today, if you for whichever recommendation you forward, to the county commissioners, that will go to, to them for a public hearing and a review, and then that will be forwarded to the Critical Area Commission. And then after Critical Area Commission approves it, the maps in the county would be updated. Regarding the town center design standards, uh, design guidelines under 18.128 D5, the applicant has provided architectural renderings. <coughs> Sorry to put these up here. Nothing has actually changed, I should say, from the uh, presentation in November. Everything remains the same. And if you know the building that's out there on the corner of Dundee and 18, these buildings would be similar to that building in style and architectural features. Where is it to go? I'm sorry? Yeah, where it's to go. These buildings? Okay. <coughs> uh, one would be here. One would be here, and there would be a, a small one here. Um, yeah, it is. It is. I have totally missed the staples. Here we go. Okay. So there would be three apartments in this building, and there would be five apartments in this building, the first floor commercial, and this would be essentially, I think there's, yeah, this, this is essentially a storage garage type of <coughs> building uh, that would go with that commercial building. Okay. Uh, regarding the comprehensive plan. The property is uh, proposing pedestrian improvements, infill. It's containing growth and it is not disturbing uh, any natural resources. Uh, 
uh, this the plan uh, identifies Chester Stevensville as an area for mixed use uh, and infill and redevelopment of this of this type. The properties are in the S1 sewer area and the I believe W2 now sewer area. Uh, also, it is encouraging pedestrian linkages. It is using the design standards and guidelines. Uh, and it is a small development over the strip commercial style. So essentially that is their, pre I will let them speak to more of the growth allocation, but uh, one of, probably the best letter that was provided back in November was the one regarding growth allocation issues proposed for the proposed <coughs> mixed use development, where they basically went down all of the issues in the critical area code and addressed those and those basically, uh, they said that the project would create a positive economic impact by increased taxes, purchase of water and sewer allocations, uh, increased economic activity for local businesses, uh, contractors, subcontractors, uh, uh, and it is located in a growth area, and it is in a PFA, and it is designated for the mixed use and infill. Um, so. With that, I will turn it over to the applicant. Ask, is, the, is it in the critical area because of Piney Creek, which is to the east? <coughs> yes. How far? What's the distance? To it's body? over 600 feet. Okay. Can I ask a generic question? Yes. Um, when I looked at the diagram, that, I don't know, this map, um, it seems like there's only three. This is a very generic question three handicap spaces. Is there a minimum, maximum that there needs to be? There's an ADA standard that it's a percent of the number of total spaces. So we can just assume that the staff has looked at that before? I mean, it would, you would make mention of that if anybody were to submit something <coughs> that they want. We don't, we, yeah, we don't control that under the zoning we're regulations. Required. Professional engineer, we're required to make sure we comply with the ADA requirements. Okay, yes. thanks. My other question might be more appropriate for you. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Go right in. Mind. The setback, the standard setback is 35 feet, and yet it's 15 along Dundee and 20 along 18. They are proposing to reduce those setbacks, and they can do that. That is something under the code that is permitted that if you accept those. At site plan. At time of site plan. Yeah. Yes, you, you would. And it's stated in there to achieve the streetscape, mm -hmm. uh, so we pulled the buildings closer. Uh, the planning staff granted that same setback for the building where the flower shop is, so we're just maintaining the same setbacks. That was done as a minor. Yeah, thanks. But it's done to encourage pulling the buildings closer to the street to get the pedestrian linkages and, and roads. Yeah, we had discussed that. We'd sat down with the applicant when they came in with this long before it was ever came to the Planning Commission and it was discussed that in order to achieve a better design on the property and have the proper parking and the circulation through the parcels that the setbacks would need to be adjusted. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, uh, J Jeff Thompson on behalf of Eastern Shore Genesis, Tom Heffelbein to my left is the managing member of Eastern Shore Genesis, of course everybody knows Tom Davis. Um, Tom, it's fair to say that this plan hasn't really changed since the November presentation other than the change that was requested by the Planning Commission? That's correct. We've okay. reduced the amount of growth allocation as was directed by uh, a proposal to do administrative lot line adjustments so that the net impervious cover on the funeral home property, which is LDA but exceeds the LDA impervious cover, would not change. So the percent impervious on the resulting lot of the funeral home, even though we're doing connections, is still the same. Okay. So how much did you reduce the growth allocation? It was originally around 2.2 acres, and we're down to 1.205, so about an acre, yes. By the whole funeral home site? Yeah. Yep. We were, by asking for the growth allocation initially, we were putting the impervious a only a, a hair over on the, on the um, funeral home site, so all we had to do was a very minor, you know, lot line adjustment to make mm -hmm. it um, no more non-conforming, if you will. That increase. So, yeah. so. Okay. Tom, you want to give an overview? Because we do have a new member of the Planning Commission, so. All right. Well, uh, kind of starting from uh, scratch, we did um, receive approval for a minor site plan for redevelopment of the corner parcel. It was a, a dilapidated residential structure that was raised and then a two-story 
uh, with first floor it has the flower shop and the, uh, the insurance business and then there's uh, three apartments on the second floor and that project was successful so Mr. Elfenbein and Eastern Shore Genesis directed us to move forward with this development in the same fashion essentially redeveloping older single-family residential structures along Dundee and uh, Maryland 18 and doing very similar kinds of buildings. Um, the architecture will all be consistent. We're addressing the town center design guidelines by interconnecting all the parking lots. We have pedestrian linkages. Uh, public water was run down to the funeral, or I'm sorry, the uh, flower shop building. So we have public sewer and public water. Um, and you know, going back to the growth allocation, this 20 acre thing, we had always interpreted that that, that was a planning tool, not a specific uh, restriction on growth allocation. And in fact, the planning commission has previously approved two growth allocations right across the street on the King Stewart site and the Maryland General site, which don't equal the 20 acres. So I think this is something that critical areas is, I'm, I'm not sure where it's coming from. Uh, but anyway, we did go through and address Comar. There's specific requirements in Comar. That was one of the letters that Holly uh, had indicated that's part of your package. So we went down step by step all the town center, all the comp plan, and the Comar requirements for growth allocation. And we believe this is consistent and you know, requesting your approval for it. I'd be glad to answer any questions about site layout, stormwater, uh, utilities, what have you. Why don't you stay the obvious? Why do you need to go from LDA to IDA? Because the lot coverage Yeah, yes. The so uses are all permitted by the code in an LDA, but the, the, the restricting factor in an LDA is 15% maximum impervious cover. Our town center district allows 80%, so there's inconsistency of what can be done from the zoning code to the critical area. So, And the, and the state put in the uh, provision for growth allocation, and the county has a certain amount. I think Holly says it's 529 acres. So we're using one acre of the 529 that the county has available. And uh, this will increase the tax base. Uh, the the single-family houses down there now are rentals. Uh, we envision new businesses coming in. Uh, the tax base will go up. So we think this is a positive project for the area. With the, I noticed on the, you've got pervious concrete there. Is that one parking lot? whole thing pitched towards that pervious yes is so what is the 100 percent retention on site of all the uh, stormwater the uh, well we're going to comply with what's called ESD to the MEP mm -hmm. and uh, you're essentially taking a site with all this impervious cover back to a woody condition so there's a significant amount of retention of runoff I don't know that it's a hundred percent but it's a reduction in the amount of runoff from what's there now because we have certain amounts of existing impervious cover. But you don't know what the... I haven't done the all the detailed volume calculations at this time. We've just done enough conceptual that the planning, uh, I'm sorry, the Department of Public Works is satisfied with our stormwater concepts as well as critical area uh, staff. But you'll do that at the time of site plan? Yes, that's more detailed design and yes. It's for the uh, newer members, uh, uh, Every uh, jurisdiction that has critical area lands and critical the critical area is that which is within a thousand feet, uh, essentially of uh, tidal waters, um, uh, was permitted back in the late 80s when the legislation was created uh, to have what uh, growth allocation and growth allocation is five percent of the acreage in each jurisdiction <coughs> that is um, RCA resource conservation areas um, and so initially Queen Anne's County had eight or nine hundred acres as I recall which represents five percent of the RCA lands in the county um, some of that acreage was uh, set aside for uh, the municipalities in the county Centerville Queenstown and so on so they had a pool that the towns could use um, the rest is for the county to use um, under the circ under this um, in compliance with the requirements of the critical area ordinance, which is Title 14, um, which Mr. Davis is saying they've complied with with respect to this 1.2 acres. Um, the biggest growth allocation was application that was approved. I think it was Four Seasons, <coughs> if I recall. Wasn't that right? Or the Four Seasons, or probably. Kmart got a pretty good one too. Yeah, 
Um, so over time, that eight or nine hundred acres has been da is now down to five hundred and some odd acres. But that's a finite number. Once you grant growth allocation for the acreage that's left in the pool, there isn't any more. Because remember, it's five percent of RCA lands. Assuming the legislature was all used up, doesn't do something. Doesn't do something else. Is right. it transferable? It says in Holly. I'm sorry. This this Tompkins memo. Um, that the county set aside 386 for the municipalities, Centerville and Queenstown. Is it that much? I don't remember. I didn't know it was that much, but okay. But can the county then give that back to generic county, i.e. Ken Island, Chester? Well, I mean, if that pool to the to the towns has been the same since 1989. But is it transferable within <coughs> the county? Does the county have that? What do you mean? Authority. Can I take it back from those? Can we get another hundred off of? Can Centerville and Queenstown only have two eighty-six, and a hundred come back to? Probably. Uh, I'm not in endorsing or encouraging that, no, so I'm the towns don't get upset. It's just a question. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'd probably. I've forgotten how three eighty-six was arrived at back in the late eighties, uh, and I don't know today whether that is consistent with the towns. Let me back up. It may have had something to do with the town's then comp plans and their uh, the expectation, if any, for annexing lands. I don't remember now, to be honest with you. But I suppose theoretically, it's possible that the towns have significantly modified their expectations for annexation, that the growth allocation pool to the towns could be changed. Thanks. Any questions for Mr. Heffelbein? He's here to answer any of the questions regarding the construction or design or if not, I guess we'll reserve other people going to testify and we might want to comment on what they have to say. Okay. Uh, anyone from the public like to comment on this project? Uh, Nicholas Thor from Chester. Um, the comments were raised in the, in the staff notes on this particular project, but my comments are broader than that, dealing with the issue of pedestrian mobility, pede pedestrian access, not just for this particular uh, site, but all pedestrian access all the way from this general vicinity where they're building 100 apartment units nearby as well, all the way uh, west toward uh, Cox Neck Road, there's a lack of smooth and effective pedestrian access. It's difficult for pedestrians to get across um, uh, Dominion Road, for example, 552. Uh, there's no easy way for pedestrians from the new um, apartments down across from the post office in Chester to walk, for example, to Safeway or vice versa for the apartments uh, that are being built up near the uh, uh, Dundee Road, uh, the promenade or whatever it's called, for them to easily access the Safeway or for that matter the future town center area if that ever gets developed. So, and, and the reason that pedestrian access is important, first of all, it's a safety issue for pedestrians. Secondly, to the, to the extent that people can do more, move around more by foot or by bicycle, it reduces the amount of automobile traffic as well. So there's a, a, a missing link in the overall planning process, particularly dealing with the Chester end of Kent Island, that there's inadequate study and thought about an integrated approach to pedestrian and bicycle mobility in that entire area. And the value of that is the trade-off with um, it reduces traffic, it improves safety, and it just makes for a more environmentally friendly uh, neighborhood in that area. That's my comment. Anyone else? Okay. Discussion, comment. I kind of like Mr. Storr's comments. <coughs> kind of. I wonder if that's something we should consider or could consider. That's my only comment. Well, I think they're valid comments. The missing link in that he referred to is money. It's, it, I mean, that's the link. Who's going to who's going to build that 
infrastructure or how are we going to fund it um, well, we, could, we have mm -hmm. a lot of that in our comp plan we have pedestrian um, and bicycle proposals in there and figuring out how how we get those built is the it's a difficult thing when you're dealing with um, well, existing in but the, at least the portion of <coughs> property that is being developed could that be no, oh, it is. It is. Yeah, there's sidewalk on it. So there's... You'll notice bits and pieces of sidewalk all the yeah. way down Main Street and Chester. The problem is the connectors. It's Route 18. So you got to sort problem. of wait for every property to, to have some sort of a project before we can uh, require a, a, a sidewalks and so on. And then on top of that is the complication that that portion of Route 18 is a state road. And state highway is not always totally cooperative. I'm just here to say we'll do our part in that piecemeal implementation. Uh, beyond that, that's really all we could do. Yeah, uh, and the right of way isn't the widest, as you know, in that portion of Main Street. Uh, but as you'll notice, if you when you drive down there from Safeway down to here, there are bits and pieces of sidewalk. You know, the problem with that whole area, though, is, is now they've run those new power lines, yeah. and there is no right-of-way. I mean, that road needs to be widened. It needs to have a turn lane, and you've got open ditch on, on one side of it. I mean, it's, it's not the safest thing. And for some of the development that's... Well, maybe if, something, maybe if something goes on the other side of the street in the and it's gonna have to district be. that I can't remember the name of... Um, Ever changing. Maybe that'll be what triggers a com comprehensive redo of that whole stretch. But Ms. Ms. McClellan, that's not to say that um, maybe a meeting with State Highway wouldn't be wouldn't be in order at, at some we've point had time. Them, and we've had them until we're blue in the face about Main yeah. Street. Yeah, I'm just thinking the markings of the you know, pedestrian access and the markings yeah. on the State yeah. Highway. It probably would be constructive. But. May I respond to your comment about money? Briefly, yes. Very briefly. Um, Generally speaking, under the federal highway uh, uh, grant process, uh, there is a set-aside requirement for pedestrian bicycle-friendly money in the overall pot of money that Maryland gets. If the county had, for Chester, a, a, a game plan, a strategy, then that's something that could be used as a basis for dipping into those set-aside pots. Uh, some of the smaller um, uh, separately incorporated towns, uh, Queenstown, uh, Chester, uh, Queenstown, and, and Centerville, and others, uh, including Church Hill. Uh, they have done a fair amount with sidewalks and, and pedestrian crossings, all funded with uh, uh, funds from outside, outside the county. And so you could task someone in either planning department or in public works department to work up and study exactly what the art, what the what's feasible in that in that sense uh, not only from a technical <clears throat> standpoint but also the financial aspects of it um, in in that regard has not the state diverted all the money that used to come to the county and use that for other things so that that pot is no longer very big I I don't do homework on that issue there's, there's there that's discussed but you can take that back up and that's something that you can also take up with your with our uh, elected officials in, in Annapolis as well. Uh, I don't have enough information to answer that. Okay. I appreciate the comments. Thanks. I would just like to throw out there that if we do, uh, if anyone is going to make a motion uh, for a favorable recommendation, that I would like the very first finding to be that the applicant voluntarily undertook a great delay and expense to accommodate our request to reduce the amount of growth allocation by 50%. I think it's, um, I'm not sure that people up the line are gonna know the history of that, and I think it's important that, uh, that whoever is looking at this in the future understands that um, they went to a great deal of effort to get to where they are. There's no other discussion. Someone can uh, make a motion for something. I'm more than happy to make a favorable recommendation.
motion, pardon me, resolve that the Planning Commission regarding the request by Eastern Shore Genesis LLC for critical area growth allocation for the redesignation of 1.205 acres of limited development area or LDA critical area lands to intensely developed area or IDA critical area lands as described in Department of Planning and Zoning file GA 0412050005-C and we hereby find Number one, I'm going to defer to the chair to repeat what he just said. The applicant voluntarily undertook great delay and expense to accommodate a planning commission request to reduce the amount of growth allocation requested by 50 percent. Number two, the proposal is identified as part of the Chester Stevensville planning growth area and is consistent with the goals and objectives of the comprehensive plan and the Chester Stevensville community plan. Number three, the property is noted as part of the Chester Stevensville planning growth area on map number two dash three as existing or infill development number four the tc zoning designation which was created with the comprehensive plan is inconsistent with the limited development area impervious surface coverage limitations number five the property is located between maryland route 5301 and maryland route 18 which are major transportation corridors in the county and an appropriate location for more intense commercial use Number six, the developer proposes to connect into the public water and sewer systems. And number seven, the property is located at the edge of the critical area and granting growth allocation will not impact the 300 foot shore buffer or any habitat protection areas nor the character of any existing waterfront area. And we would make a favorable recommendation to the Queen Anne's County Commissioners to award the request subject to the following technical comments. Number one, the development of the site will satisfy the TC design guidelines as prescribed in the community plan. The TC design standards handbook and further reflected in chapter 18. Number two, the applicant designed a, pede a pedestrian oriented development avoiding the typical strip commercial development pattern. Number three, a pedestrian bike connection is created in concurrence with the development of the adjacent developing Maryland general land property. Number four, four-sided architecture, full, full facade treatment on all ele elevations is accomplished at site plan review, which is consistent with the renderings previously presented to the Planning Commission for concept plan approval. Number five, the architecture proposed will maintain a similar style as that which exists already on parcel 92. Number six, the applicant consider roadway treatments to allow for safe pedestrian mid-block and intersection crossings. Number seven, additional vegetative buffering to shield building facades from the roadways be provided. Number eight, the applicant shall provide additional green space in the parking area and around pedestrian connections where possible. Number nine, the property development design will limit the impervious surface as necessary to achieve the 10 percent pollutant reduction to meet critical area best management practices. Second. Second. Any discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you, members. Welcome, Mr. Reese. Thank you. Okay. That takes us to minor site plan number 04-13-01-0005-C, McDonald's USA LLC v. May. McDonald's uh, minor site plan, as you mentioned. Uh, for this, I prepared a memo basically just reiterating the three concerns that were <coughs> voiced by you at the end of the presentation from last month. Uh, those three issues that we noted uh, were the traffic volumes at the other McDonald's on the north side of 5301. Number two was accident information at the Thompson Creek roundabout. And number three was pedestrian safety access and pathways within the shopping center. And regarding those issues, number one, 
the applicant has, in fact, provided information to us. We received it uh, Tuesday evening, I believe, and it, uh, that has been given to you this morning regarding additional information they have compiled <clears throat> and uh, some counts that they have taken for the existing McDonald's and they will be presenting that information to you today, uh, elaborating on information from last month's presentation. Regarding issue number two and accident information, the Planning Commission attorney did contact the Maryland State Police and they forwarded some information via email which was attached to your packet. Since then we have also received some information from the Sheriff's Office and I believe there is representative from the Sheriff's Office here today and uh, also of people from SHA uh, will be here to discuss the roundabout and any information regarding it uh, design and accident wise. And lastly, pedestrian safety, the applicant did supply, uh, supply a revised site plan which is here um, and it has some pathways that they would, I assume, be painting within the shopping center regarding access and pedestrian safety. Uh, separately from that, I'd like to just go over some information regarding the county's position, uh, or I should say what we do here with APFO, since some of you are new uh, and new newer uh, as well, just a, a little bit of information. This is very specific to McDonald's. This is not an overview of all APFO process with uh, adequate in, in, public facilities. Yes, ordinance. sorry, adequate public facilities ordinance. I was about to say that. Okay. Uh, but basically regarding McDonald's, what, what we did is uh, when the applicant contacted us about this time last year, we, we worked with them to do a scoping. And basically a scoping is where we decide what intersections to study, <clears throat> what hours to study, what days to study, uh, what backgrounds to include, all sorts of things like that. What is their proposed use? Are they going to base it on a number of people or square footages, uh, all that kind of thing. So that, that goes into the scoping and that, and, and that is decided upon mostly by the county. We work with SHA as well. We work with the sanitar sanitary department. It's all water, sewer, and roads for this particular study. So th that goes into it. Uh, but specifically the scoping is for the, for the traffic intersections. The applicant was sent that scoping on August 30th and we direct, directed them to look specifically at five intersections. Those intersections were as follows. The Maryland Route 8 at the Thompson Creek Service Road, the Thompson Creek Road at Thompson Creek Mall Road, site access from Thompson Creek Mall Road, site access from Thompson Creek Road, the service road, when I say the service road, one's in front and one's, one's in the back, and also, of course, the Thompson Creek Roundabout. So those were the, the five intersections we directed them to look at. We also included five background developments, uh, Four Seasons, Ellendale, Cloisters, the Vineyards, and the Kindergarten. Those were the uh, background developments at that time. Since then, Kindergarten has been developed. We also include a 2% growth rate and so the background development goes on top of the growth rate so it's a very conservative uh, estimation of development and then we also decide on the times and hours uh, we uh, we go with the week weekday a.m. which is 7 to 9 and the weekday p.m. which is 4 to 6 and we also requested Saturday and Sunday appropriate midday or uh, uh, peak hours, and that was actually uh, a bone of contention with the applicant. They were not interested in doing Sunday, and we said, you're doing Sunday, and so they did it. Uh, the background, uh, okay, I'm sorry. The um, One of the things that should be noted in the, the study, we had discussed with the applicant that since there is an existing building, there are existing uses, there are existing trips being generated so that they would actually have been able to take those trips out of the count and use those towards their new generation. If they generated more trips than the existing use, would have to put those on top, but they essentially could subtract those or include those, but they didn't. So they basically put all of the background trips that that building currently generates and then 
put the McDonald's trips on top of that as if a new McDonald's was going in and that building still would be there. So that was even more information. So more trips being generated than actually may be generated. Uh, and, then, and then lastly, according to the study, what they did is they did counts starting on January 17th, 2012, which was a Tuesday. They did an August 25th study at the roundabout, which was a Saturday. They did an October uh, 2nd study Tuesday. That was also at the roundabout. October 13th, uh, which was a Saturday. October 16th, which was a Tuesday. October 21, which is a Sunday at the roundabout, and October 23rd, which was a Sunday. So they, they, they came out and did actual counts uh, at, at, those, at the roundabout in those specific days, and the other intersections were on the other days. And that is all in this information that we provided. So uh, if you have any other questions regarding, but that's, that is the specifics, and that's what we required, and that's what they presented, and SHA did review it. And SHA had no issues with the level of service, and neither did the county. Holly, I have a question. I think a lot of people, I feel, were concerned not with, um, you know, those counts that were done on Sundays were done in October versus a count that's done in July. So how does that, you know, affect the traffic that goes by there? Clearly, anyone that lives on the island with the beach traffic knows that those are going to be way off, I would think. I don't. You're it correct. They, they did do an August 25th Saturday count at the roundabout, which would be the summer. Uh, so we, we didn't say that what they did was wrong. Okay, I'm just posing what is we're looking, most likely we're, we're looking at capacity at the intersections. We're looking to see that they function properly. There may be a lot of cars going through it, maybe many, many cars going through it, but does it function properly the way it was designed to function? And that, that's what the APFO specifically looks at, not say the number of cars that go through it, but does it work? Does it work? Okay, yeah. thanks. And the, the APFO is specifically related to levels of service, which, I get as it. I understand it, we'll hear more about this, but level of service is essentially the amount of time it takes you to get through an intersection. I get it. I was just yeah. trying to throw it out there before. Sure. Okay. I didn't know if you had anybody else from the state or um, state highway. I don't know if you want to do that now. Right, we're not sponsoring anybody else. So oh, I didn't know if you, I, that was the impression I had, that, you know, whether you had anybody else coming in from the state. Okay, that's fine. Okay, great. Do you want to come on? Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, Joe Stevens um, with uh, Jerry Gimblestock, who is the going to be the owner of the McDonald's on Ken Island, um, and I've got Ken Schmidt here with Traffic Concepts, who's going to go over what they put together for you. But what I'd like to just say briefly is, is, is you just heard Holly say in her description of the APF the um, uh, standards that, they, that, that Ken followed in preparing the study with those standards as set out by the county. That's how we essentially determine whether or not there's capacity in the intersections and whether or not it's going to cause any problems in that intersection. As you'll see from what, um, what Ken put together, the only place that there is a, even a decrease in level of service, still at acceptable levels under the county's own ordinance, is at the intersection of Thompson Creek and, I mean Thompson Creek Service Road and uh, Maryland Route 8, where you have the cloisters being added in and you have um, um, the vineyards being added in and so on. So, so every place else is an A level of service. Um, what we did, though, and what you have before you is, 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 um, is really a summary of the traffic study that's been into the county for months and months. So it's, it's, not, it's not like we've done anything new except for the count that you asked us to do, I believe Commissioner Moran did, asked us to do at the other McDonald's. And Ken will go over that. That's the only real new information that wasn't part of the county record. And a few photographs were added. But, the, but what it is is a summary of the APF, a summary of the counts, um, a summary of the projections, and, uh, and then a point-by-point -point response to some of the questions, or many of the questions we think that came up last month. Um, so Ken, with that, if you could come on up, introduce yourself, go through that. Mr. Stevens, before we get to him, mm -hmm. um, you guys do this study for the adequate public facilities ordinance. What happens with it? 
after that? You mean after it's submitted? When you submit it, what happens with that it's, study? It's uh, approved by somebody makes a decision. I just want you to just review. Okay, yeah. What, what happens is, and, and can I, or Steve can, can jump in if I leave a step out, but it goes to the various agencies for review. It goes to um, it goes to State Highway Administration. It goes to the Department of Public Works, and then they circulate it. And can the, who does State Highway Administration circulate it to? They circulated to the district office. They circulated to the Office of Traffic and Safety. They circulated to forecasting, long-range forecasting, and they circulated to access management. Okay, and then they consolidate their comments, and they come back to the county. And if the comments, usually what happens is it's not approved first time around. I don't think it was this time either. You get comments. Hey, hey. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mr. Stevens, I'm sorry. What, what was this gentleman saying? Ken Schmid. He's president of Traffic Concepts. They prepared the traffic analysis in this instance and have done all the additional work that's uh, before you today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, then that uh, goes back to the county. Uh, their comments are addressed and get back circulated to SSHA and to the County Department of Public Works. And eventually, I believe it goes to the TRC, which is the um, Technical Review Committee, which is made up of various agency staff persons. Steve, I'm not sure who all the makeup is. Maybe you could elaborate on that. <clears throat> the technical review committee that would issue a letter of adequacy or or not adequacy is made up of um, the a representative of the county commissioners or county administrator, um, the director of planning and zoning, the director of public works, and then we also have somebody from the board of education on there looking at the school school section. So it's, it's a committee um, of the review agencies that are involved with the. Uh, um, the specific infrastructure that we're dealing with. Good. Thank you. We don't get to file a site plan until that's happened and we receive that letter. So we received that letter and that's why you see it being submitted back in November of last year and now we're just here before you. Actually June last month was our first time here before you because you have to get that letter, you have to get that approval before you can move forward um, with site plan approval. Okay. Okay. My name is Ken Schmid. I'm pres Vice President of Traffic Concepts. Uh, we've been a traffic engineering consultant firm for about 23 years. I have experience at Maryland State Highway Administration and Arundel County Department of Public Works and have been working in the private sector for about 22 years providing traffic engineering services to the private sector as well as public sector, state governments, county governments, and cities and towns. Um, we were contracted to prepare the traffic impact study and and bef last hearing, Mark Keeley from my office was here and did some testimony. Uh, Mark works under me and is in charge of this area, and he's a project manager for projects in Queen Anne's County. Mark had a hearing in Baltimore County this morning, so I drew the long straw and I get to come down to beautiful Centerville to do some testimony. Um, what I want to do is go through the letter that's, that I believe was submitted to you all. Um, dated July 8th, it's a great letter. Um, and basically what we did is we tried to put this together to address some of the, the comments that came up from the public and from the uh, Planning Commission as well as to sort of try to summarize again what a traffic study is, how we go about putting it together. And, and frankly, I think Holly did a good job of explaining the traffic impact study. The traffic impact studies are prepared to coincide, coincide with the requirements of the adequate public facilities law. We don't establish what the levels of service need to be. We don't establish the methodology. We study these intersections. They're all established by the, commission, the county commissioners when they establish the adequate public facilities law. We develop a traffic study to meet those guidelines and present that study to the county and the state for review and approval. Um, we go th um, I'm not going to reiterate the whole thing, but we go through that scoping meeting. You can come out in. Uh, section A of that letter, which is the TIS summary, it talks about how we do data collection. Counts are good for up to a year old. Um, sometimes we decide, what, like in, in this case, we had gone through a scoping meeting and we had already had counts on Saturdays at a lot of these intersections during the summer. And sometimes the county wants the counts when school's in session, and sometimes the state likes to see counts during the summer. We had this issue come up many times on Kent Island, and frankly, probably about seven or eight years ago, we did a study of the 
road net network, not 50, but the surrounding secondary road system and put tube counts out and counted traffic during the fall and during the summer. And what we found on these secondary roads is that on typical days, there's higher volumes on these secondary roads during the fall, winter, and spring than there is in the summer. Now, there's, there's occasions when 50 overflows and people try to divert to these more secondary roads, but in general... Oh, one second, we're going to change the tape. So in general, we've always been trying to do our counts when school's in session. But we use the summer count for Saturdays because the state tends to like to see them. And then this way we had a variation of a, Saturday, a weekday, weekends on a Saturday in the summer and a Sunday in the fall. So I think we've covered both bases there. And, and, and that's the reason we didn't recount the Saturday counts because we had some summer counts that were still good. And we wanted to give that different perspective between summer and, and fall on a weekend. Um, the traffic studies put together on this case, just like every other case, um, we, we count, we use our existing counts to establish base levels of service. We factor in the impact of the background developments, which were six and identified. We've, and we build those developments out and add their traffic to those key intersections. And the final step is to estimate the amount of trips our site will generate. And we had a, just some discussions with Mark about this and how to develop it because there is an existing use on this site that we're going to replace. And our experience has shown us that we sometimes get into um, questions and issues about well, how much traffic is actually being generated by the use. We use the IT trip generation manual to project those, but there's actual counts out there. And so you mean, just to clarify, so you, you, when there's an existing use, you will just use what the manual says as per that land use, and sometimes individuals or planning commissions or staff will question and say, well, wait a second, why don't you just go out and count what's actually coming out of that restaurant, hotel, whatever. Right. And in cases like, like this, where we were pretty comfortable the road system was going to be okay, we've done enough studies along this car to know that we decided the safest and most conservative way would be just to add all new trips and just to not take account for what's already been generated that's going to be replaced, but to just say we're going to add McDonald's is going to produce all new trips. So in this essence, we're keeping the traffic that's going to be replaced and adding our traffic on top to come to a very conservative number or trip, trip volumes on our road network for our future condition uh, calculations. Mr. Schmidt, on this particular topic, we had a number of emails that came in this week indicating that there were some traffic count strips at one intersection and only one intersection last week or the week before that, and that made this whole traffic study um, questionable. Did, did you guys have anything to do with those strips that were put down? Did that have anything to do with no. this study? Not at all. In the last week? That's what the in, uh, emails indicated. Uh, I, I assume you're talking about the little tubes that go across the road? I, I, I didn't write the emails. We, they weren't them. put down by us. So okay. I, 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 all, all I our counts were done well before we... The only new counts we've done is the ones at the existing McDonald's. And we didn't put tubes down. We had physically people there doing the counts. Mr. Schmidt, I have a question for you, and you might not know the answer. Do you have any idea how many cars cross the Bay Bridge coming eastbound during peak hours? No, I don't. So I'm guessing that that would not play into your traffic study at all? No, ma'am. So results of our analysis, again, showed we, on page three of this summary, we show the Levels of service, they, they are rated from A to F, A being the, the, the best capacity condition, C being the upper limit of uh, peak hour levels of service by the adequate public facilities law, e, D, E, and F being uh, above capacity. Um, all the intersections, as Joe had mentioned, were A levels of service during all time periods except for the intersection of A to Thompson Creek Pier 1 Road, where it was a B level of service on a weekday evening, a C level of service on a Saturday, and a B level of service on a Sunday. So it all fell within the requirements of the adequate public facilities law. So our conclusion was that the road system can handle the additional traffic by the McDonald's without any additional road improvements. That study was put together, submitted to the county and state, reviewed by all those different agencies, and the conclusion came back was they con confirmed with our 
our results and, and approved the traffic impact study. At the intersection where the level of service was, to, was decreased to either B or C from A, would that, did, would that decrease res, happen even if McDonald's or no other use went on this site as a result of the cloisters and the vineyards? Yes, and I mean, there, the cloisters and the vineyards and the, are, have a lot of build, build out to do, and they're going to add a lot more more traffic to that intersection. They're, they're responsible for taking that to an A, to a B, and an A to a C. But again, that's still well within the, re the acceptable levels of service uh, dictated by the commissioners. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a question, Mr. Smead. Sure. If, does your traffic study take into account a what, uh, eastbound traveler only going, uh, I guess, westbound back on the service road, or does it count every vehicle that enters that traffic circle that may be going to the Cracker Barrel or the Dash Inn or the other yeah, well, businesses we, that go down Thompson? When we do our existing count, we establish all that existing traffic flow. So we anybody that's going through that roundabout today is accounted for. Cracker Barrel, the residents, the, the shopping center. The next step is to predict what's going to happen with these background developments and what's that going to add to these intersections. And we determine what flow and we put that flow through that roundabout as well. And then our future is how's our traffic for the McDonald's going to get into the McDonald's and out of the McDonald's and some of that obviously goes through the roundabout and that's added to those future vo that, that volume and then we establish future volumes. Okay, follow up question if I sure. may. Did you evaluate any of the data that Cracker Barrel may have done from their traffic survey prior to doing yours? You know, we did the to we, show any we did the study for Cracker Barrel, and I was sitting here thinking, I'm not sure if the roundabout was actually in yet, or it was just about to be put in when the Cracker Barrel came in. I'm I don't not think really sure. It was in. Okay, so it was in, but you now I don't. I, I did. We we didn't go back and look at our historical data on this one. We just redid our counts and, and, and established uh, the base conditions based on current year counts. Um, I know the Cracker Barrel is very popular and, and, and the traffic going through the roundabout is seen by me and seen by the, the numbers we calculated to be operating very well from a capacity standpoint for sure. Thank you. Just out of curiosity, these uh, ratings of A, B, and C, if I understand this correctly, they are all based on how long it takes to get through an intersection, a roundabout? Well. Is that the major sort of component of it? The roundabout, yes. The other signalized and unsignalized intersections, what we do, we do, in a, uh, the analysis we do is called critical lane volume. And basically it's a summation of the volumes that travel through an intersection that conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. So if you have one car going straight and one car going left, there are two critical trips because one's trying to go past the same point in the road. And basically what critical lane does is sum, sums all those critical movements through the intersection for an hour and, and assigns a level of service. So if a critical lane volume is zero to 1,000, it's an A. From 1,000 to 1,150 is a B. From 1,150 to 1,300 is a C. And from 1,300 to 1,450 is a D. And 1,450 to 1,600 is an E and an F. So there are some methodologies that look at actual delay, but critical lane volume does not. It's just a summation of the critical movements. And, I'm sorry, go ahead. The roundabout analysis, we use what's called SIDRA, and it's analysis particularly to analyze roundabouts. And it does look at, it looks at both delay for the approaches, but what it looks at is the, what's called the volume to capacity ratio. How much capacity can the roundabout as its design handle, and what is the volume? And if it's at theoretical capacity is one. If it's at 50% capacity, it's the volume to capacity ratio is 0.5. And I think under future conditions, the, the highest volume to capacity ratio we have at the roundabout is 0.47, I think. Is there any study that ties safety with the ABC rating? Well, no. Okay, so there's no, there's no real correlation. You can have an A intersection, certainly but it could can. be a very deadly intersection. You certainly can. And you can have F levels of service <coughs> intersections that have good accident rates. So the state highway, <clears throat> Thompson Creek Road is a state road. Mm -hmm. And the state highway has a program on their own where they analyze accidents on all their state intersections all throughout the state every year. And they determine what intersections and road sections are at a higher rate of accidents than the state average and they're required by federal law to study those intersections why are they higher and 
try to remediate the problem that's causing those accidents. So the state has keeps accident data on all the intersections throughout the state and through the state police. And to my knowledge, I've, I'm, I'm not aware that this intersection is anywhere near a high accident location. Could, could we bring up the gentleman from the state highway so we might ask him some of these sure. questions as they come up? Sure. <coughs> here, I'll let him sit here. <coughs> Just pull up another chair. There Hello, my name is Mike Niederhauser, and I work for the Maryland State Highway Administration. Uh, Having just heard the comments uh, from Mr. Schmid, um, do you have any comment on the safety of Well, the as, as far as the safety goes, um, I got a call about a week ago, or maybe two weeks ago, concerning this today's meeting. So this roundabout was put in place one day, September 12, 2007, and um, so what I did was, as I went to our accident people, I ordered accidents. I just said, give me everything from 2008 on, uh, realizing that given three months of uh, uh, getting used to, um, more or less, for, for drivers. Um, and and we, our accident database is reported police crashes. Not every accident is reported. If it's a fender bender and vehicles are able to drive away or there is not a injury, um, it's usually not a, re a reported crash. It's uh, on our Mars reports, which is Maryland accident, um, Maryland motor vehicle accident reports. Uh, and they are compiled by the different police agencies sent in the state police, and ultimately we get those crashes. Um, we had one police reported crash since the roundabout has opened in 2011. One. Um, okay. So. Um, I have a couple follow up questions that I'd like to ask now if you guys can. Sure. That's fine. The APFO studies that come from the county, I don't know whether you would know this, they come to state highways, that, and you guys look at those? Yes, it goes to our access permits people, and they. They send them out to all the offices that are affected. So if you had a problem with the study that came through and you thought it was going to be problematic for... I send my comments back, and regularly, when, when there's a round... I'm the roundabout coordinator for State Highway. So when there's a roundabout that's within that uh, development area of study, um, which we... I mean, we have... Maryland State Highway Administration has 75 roundabouts that we've built on state highways. So I get many studies that have roundabouts in them now. Um, and you can, can attest to this. If there's something wrong, I'm the first one that says unacceptable. Something has to be done to bring this and you roundabout. Did, and you did not find something unacceptable in this? Absolutely situation. not. Okay. We, we had a number of, of uh, emails and some testimony that the traffic circle was substandard when it was built. Is that the is there a standard for what traffic circle should be in yes, size? Yes, um, sir. For size, uh, typically a, a, a conventional roundabout, like the one that's on the other side uh, on Castle Marina Road, that's got raised splitter islands, raised curbs in the central island, that's typically around 120 feet for that area. That's Total diameter. outside diameter. Um, this is a mini roundabout. The painted roundabout is what's considered a mini roundabout. And they're always less than 100 foot in total diameter. This one and uh, this particular roundabout at Thompson Creek is, it's not a perfect circle, so it's anywhere from 75 to 80 feet total outside diameter. Um, uh, we wouldn't, the Maryland State Highway, that's just the only second one that we've built. Because many. Sorry, painted, you're talking about painted. Many, 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 yeah, painted, painted many, okay. yeah. Um, <clears throat> some minis have fully traversable central islands, which are mounded up, but that's for truck use. Um, this particular intersection, and, and going back to what I was saying before, a mini, all speeds must, should be posted 30 miles an hour or less, all roadways coming in. This, this was, this met that case. There aren't many state highway administration intersections that have those speeds coming from all directions. Um, so 
you know, after we looked at a conventional intersection, we, we couldn't fit it in uh, because of the tight right turn radius off the ramp from 50 trucks making deliveries would have never been able to do it without going up onto the central islands and the curbs on the outside and whatnot. So that's the reason why we did the paint it. Um, I mean, we watched it very closely for six to six to months to, to a year afterwards. And, and we monitored the accidents and, and the district would get calls if, if they were, if, if there was a problem, they never got any calls. Um, it, it certainly cleared up the confusion from the previous intersection. And um, I think the safety record speaks for, speaks for itself. Thank you. Uh, I'm more than happy to go on record as I'm one of the accidents that happened. I lived down Thompson Creek that was not reported right. during snow and went right up on the side and some lovely people from one of the gas stations helped me. So if that should happen during, uh, and Mr. Schmid, had you picked the long stick truly, you would have had to be testifying during peak bridge hours and got to make the lovely trip across the bridge and all the way up to our beautiful county seat here. Um, I did not, that obviously that wasn't reported in the circle. Yeah, that's, that's I mean, I'm not saying that there aren't crashes that And that I'm have in occurred. that every single day. And I see trucks, there is no mound in the middle. That's right. And if you stay for testimony, I'm sure you're going to hear my neighbors okay. and, and uh, my I'm not going family. Anywhere. Trucks go over the curb. There's never been, there's little um, reflective poles there. They're, they're always missing. You could go through today and they're not complete. Not a full set. At least it wasn't last night when I went. There, there are two that are laying down. Yeah. Or to the land now. Um, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, that every truck drives it properly, but they're not doing it at high rates of speed. Uh, a conventional intersection, that's where we have, you know, a conventional four leg crossed intersection, signalized. Signalized intersections are our highest accident locations in the state. I have to tell you, I moved into um, my subdivision in summer of 2001. I was first subdivision down there on the left-hand side, single-family homes, and I was first resident there. And at the time, there was still a stop sign mm -hmm. off of 50, and the circle did help. However, traffic has increased, and putting a, and no offense to McDonald's because I do my fair share but putting a McDonald's at that, the second exit off the bridge and not being able to um, tell me and my neighbors and Ken Island family, number one, that you don't know how many cars cross during peak hours, and number two, that not every single, even just a tenth of them are going to take that second exit and not only make our lives miserable, but oftentimes congest us because there's only there's a secret way out. Um, the people that live down Thompson Creek know, but I don't want to announce it to the universe <laughs> because this is being taped. Um, I just think that 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 it's it, there's no way this study can be legitimate. And and, and uh, the, I, I understand that you put your facts in, data in, data out. I totally get that, but I don't think you're taking into account looking a year out the sort of traffic that this will bring to that little mini circle that the state has only endorsed two of. Well, uh, I think we have captured all the vehicles that are there. I, I don't, I, I'm not sure I understand. Well, you can't capture what isn't there yet, is my point. Mm -hmm. And McDonald's, but, God but, bless McDonald's and the clown, they truly are, you know, but, Americana. But, but Ken hasn't even subtracted the, via, uh, the, 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 the traffic that's generated by the present Yeah, that, your, your apples and oranges. That's, that's totally different what goes in now and what's going to go in in a McDonald's. You can count all you want today. You can count all you want during peak traffic but today. But he did no, count projected, did count new projected, projected trips. Yeah, yeah, not right. during peak hours. Of, yes, how many, he did. How many yes, 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 he did. the Bay Bridge during peak doesn't, hours? They're not crossing the Bay Bridge the doesn't have anything to do with it's this sure, particular intersection. It will. It absolutely will. <laughs> Yeah, that's, um, you're, you're welcome. In regards to saying the Bay Bridge doesn't have anything to do with it, 
your counts include what's coming off of Route 50. You, you're not counting the tra traffic on route on the Route 50, but you're counting what's going to come off of Route 50 to go to this area. Counting the key intersections that are identified by the county. Okay. And that included traffic that might come off of 50. And then you put in a growth factor for existing, exi for development in the pipeline. Is that correct? Well, we factored in for the developments that have already been identified as approved and not built, plus we factored in a 2% growth And that factor. goes, does that go into factoring in mm -hmm. all the traffic that's going to increase in that area? That's correct. Okay. And, um, and then you add on the new development. Is that correct? That's correct. Is that, and that also includes an increase in the traffic of cars that are going to pull off of Route 50 in terms of background growth. Yes, we estimate a certain percentage of the traffic that we call pass-by trips that are traveling along 50, that now that there's McDonald's there, we'll decide to say, I'm not going to keep going straight on 50. I'm going to turn off on to and go into the McDonald's and then turn back and go out and continue east on 50. So you don't know how many trucks traffic, excuse me, how many trips or traffic, how much traffic is going over the Bay Bridge, but you know how much is going to get off. We um, estimate how much is going to get off based on the trip generation uh, information that's in the IT trip generation manual, which we're required to use by Queen Anne's County to project our traffic. Plus your counts. That's correct. Question made, you said you had actual counters there counting traffic and... Yes, sir. Did you ever see where the service road coming up in Route 50, were there ever any backups? Not that we're, my, my counters are told to identify any uh, unusual situations at intersections, and we had none, nothing like that on that. Right. And, and I wanted to say again, that we, we were involved with the development of your house. We were here testifying and doing our traffic impact study, to, you know, two, two developments on the water. And the, the configuration of the existing intersection was an issue for the Planning Commission. We worked with State Highway and trying to come up with ways to, to improve the intersection. They, there were ideas of taking the off-ramp and moving it to the west and line up from the existing shopping center entrance to try to split the traffic. There was a bunch of different things looked at by the state and the county. And the long and short of it, the best solution was this roundabout. And Probably the reason the state doesn't have a lot of mini roundabouts is because the state doesn't have many mini intersections. <laughs> Most of the state highway intersections are big intersections, so they can fit the big roundabout. The mini roundabouts have been used effectively in a lot of these more secondary frontage road type situations where you don't warrant a traffic signal, where you don't want to put in a four-way stop, but you want this continuous flow. And the key is that the roundabouts and Mike can, is the type of accidents are completely different than the type of accidents that occur at a stop control or a traffic light. Stop control and traffic lights are much more intense accidents than, than roundabouts. Roundabouts, everybody's controlled to, to 15 to 20 miles an hour, so if there's an accident, it's a fender bender or side, and that's one of the advantages of yeah. implementing roundabout control. So there's a situation that there was an unusual intersection that was built when 50 was made access controlled with this frontage road, as the traffic grew, the, the, what was proposed didn't work, or what was installed didn't work, and it was improved with this roundabout. And, it was, thank you. And right now, based on the numbers we use for roundabout, there's plenty of capacity to this roundabout to handle this additional traffic and traffic beyond what we've proposed in this study. Well, with that being said, I mean, to get just so the public can understand this a little bit better, can you give us just numbers just i mean i i understand that you divide uh, uh, after reading this that and i think everyone here is really concerned about the circle i mean <laughs> should be concerned about the red light because those i agree i mean i had a friend almost die at that that intersection got hit by a truck but uh with the with respect to the roundabout your study that you're you're using the numbers from last august is that correct the study that was done last august well, some of the counts were done in August, some were done in October. Correct. So okay. use, using those numbers, because we didn't recount this right. this year. Right. So using those numbers, can, can you tell us how many cars enter that roundabout at, it, at its busiest time? I, I don't, you know, you, you tell me which day was the busiest and how many cars enter that. And then can you tell me what the busiest time was at the, the other McDonald's? And adding those numbers together is your worst case scenario. And are we still in A? We're in A. Well, give, give me the numbers, okay. if you don't mind. Um, because, I mean, I, I can read this, but it does get kind of confusing. So, I mean. 
comments, the highest projected. Of all the vehicles that entered a roundabout, existing, the existing the highest peak is the PM peak, mm -hmm. is 1,045. 1,000, and, and that's for a one hour? All direction, one hour time. That's one hour, the highest peak hour. So the highest peak hour was 1,045 vehicles in, the, in that roundabout? Yes. Okay, so what was the uh, highest peak hour of that McDonald's that we, we asked you to count? on the westbound traffic? The peak, the time period hour? Correct. It's I mean, you're, you're telling me- The, the, the highest time period- well, The highest let time- me, Let me go, let me talk about that first, maybe to answer sure. the question. Okay. We counted the existing McDonald's. Um, this isn't quite what he's asking. Seven. He's asking the total number of cars in and out of the intersection, which is bracketed by the McDonald's and the gas station. He's, he's and I gave him that number. Okay, that's what he's asking. I gave him that number. All right, go ahead. Well, he wants to know the number. 1,045. No, no, no. I'm asking. Uh, now now you got us confused. The no. roundabout. You said the roundabout's highest peak hour was 1,045 cars going in and out of that roundabout. During the hour. The roundabout where. The total volume. Question. Yeah, the total volume Correct. in that one hour. That now, now I want to know what the total volume of cars that went in and out of the existing McDonald's on the westbound side of 50. McDonald's yeah. or that intersection? Well, that intersection, correct, that intersection. That's where it got confusing because they, in the report, they start to go down to percentages. And right. we, we got this last night at 6 o'clock, right. so and, for and those of uh, us who had an opportunity right. to even look at it, that's, that's where our confusion So I just want to know, you know, again, you've got... We, we, we've established it's 1,045 is, is the peak at the roundabout at Thompson Creek. So now I, I just want to know what the peak vehicles going through that intersection at the existing McDonald's that we add on top of this, and you're going to tell me that's still an A. Well, oh, well, yeah. Wait a minute. Yeah. Let me clarify the question. Okay. Because I, I don't understand. Yeah. I don't want to answer it. I got, I got to understand. Sure. Um, you're asking that we that – we add all the traffic that goes through the entire intersection at Castle Marina Road to all the traffic to the intersection? No, the just what turns no, no, no. right separate. in. What's the separate? Yeah, turn. The, what's the, the two separate locations? No, no, I understand his question. He's asking me Castle Marina. He wants to know if all the traffic. No, what turns right to go off of Castle off Marina? Of, into off of McDonald's? Route 50 to turn onto Castle Marina, coming from the east, going westbound, during peak hours. Well, is they can get to that. No, I, I want. We count that. The only no. what we counted and what we thought you requested was that we tell you how much traffic was going in and out of the existing McDonald's. That's that correct. correct. That's, that's correct. correct. And, and we calculate can add those to if you want to take that high peak. That's correct. The highest volume right. was the AM peak because everybody's going over to the Western mm -hmm. Shore. And if you take that highest volume AM peak, but, uh, was it AM peak? What, Mr. Stevens, let me clarify that. Everybody's AM peaked on a weekend. A weekday. On a weekday. At the Castle Marina. That's the highest volume. I believe. Oh, no, 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 no. Let me, yeah, let, let's, 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 right let me try and explain right. what we did first and maybe you understand. We counted the traffic at the existing McDonald's during the morning, weekday morning peak, mm -hmm. afternoon peak, Saturday and Sunday peak. Okay. What we found was that based on the IT rates, that's the average rates, that McDonald's was generating approximately... 45% um, higher volume in the AM than projected by ITE. Is that average over all of the counts you took? That's over the week. No, that's the weekday AM. We counted the weekday and went from 7 to 9, found the peak hour, and said that based on ITE rates, which are average, this site is generating 45% higher trips than projected by ATE in the AM weekday peak period. During the PM weekday peak period, that McDonald's is generating 6.8% higher trips than, than would be projected by ITE. So On a Saturday... It's a very busy McDonald's, is that what it means? Mm -hmm. It's <laughs> it's, than it's, the average. A, it's average for the weekday PM within 6% is pretty good. Saturday, it's been within 1.1% okay. of what's projected by ITE. AM, PM? Saturday peak. That's, new, that's between 11 and 2. Okay. On a noon time. <laughs> and then Sunday. Peak. It was the same, Sunday peak is the same 1.9%. 11 to 2? Yes, ma'am. 
And that's the peak of the adjacent road and the peak of this use. Okay, so getting back to the original so, question. So, during the AM peak, mm -hmm. that McDonald's is generating much more than the average rate of a McDonald's. Okay, so what's our worst case scenario? So all I want to know is what that number is. That number would be an additional 96 cars. Now, is that divided by your four point because of the square footage, or is that the exact actual? We already factored that in. We, we came up with the rate per thousand square feet of a McDonald's store. Correct, but my question is, if I'm standing on that corner and that AM peak, am I gonna only count 96 cars? Or am no, I gonna count gonna, 96 no, no, times four gonna, point whatever it is? You're gonna count, um, in, in and out of the McDonald's, there were uh, 274 trips. That means everybody, Maybe. one person goes in, he's one sure. trip, he leaves, he's two trips. Correct, so, so that was my uh, question is, you have 274 trips, and then the 1,045 in the roundabout, there was no dividing of that number. That was the actual. Oh, yeah, no. Not everybody's coming off of 50 to the roundabout. Some people are coming from I understand that, Route but my, 8 coming up. In I understand that, but my question is you're not taking any calculations from square footage and dividing in that number. That's actual counted cars. That's Somehow, actual. wherever they, however they got into, right. got into that circle. That's right. So now we get up to this. So now we're like, let, let's just say 13, 1320 mm -hmm. in this roundabout now projecting the worst case scenario. At 1320, is that roundabout still considered an A? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Can I ask another question? Um, <laughs> right, that's all. No, but that's fine, right. I was yeah. confused too. Right. The Saturday and Sunday, was it one Saturday and one Sunday you looked at? <coughs> yes, ma'am. What dates? We're talking about the McDonald's or the roundabout? The um, Saturday and Sunday that they just did on the Chester McDonald's. Saturday, June 22nd, and Sunday, June 23rd. So. Yeah, why don't you go on? We'll sidetrack, but we'll get back to <laughs> the report. And addressing the comments. So basically, the, the comments that came and I'm going to go to my section B of this re this letter, was this page four. Um, one of the, some of the members suggested, and the public suggested, the counts, dates, and sub study submission time were done improperly. Basically, the county allows the counts to be a year old. I tried to explain why we didn't reduce Saturdays to try to keep a su summer count time frame, and we could have, but we tried to keep it in there. Uh, the Sundays were done on the out of peak because. We frankly didn't understand why we were doing Sundays because Saturday's the peak time and trying to save money for our clients, but we acquiesced and did the Sunday counts and showed everything fine, but they, they were done in October. Um, the counts were done during the seven to nine, four to six. Every peak hour fell within that seven to nine and four to six. So we did capture the peak hour for on our counts. So we believe the counts were done properly and perfect and proper time frame and are reflective of the peak hour operation at these intersections. Um, somebody made a comment that the Thompson Creek Service Road was analyzed with three lanes. I'm not sure what that meant. I wasn't here, but Thompson Creek Service Road intersections were assumed to have one lane in each direction and shared left turn movements and right turn movements out of that one lane. Uh, again, the other comments was we only studied the Thompson Creek Service Road. The parameters of the study were set up by the county and the state. It was, long, it was primarily along the Thompson Creek Service Road from the roundabout up to Route 8. There was a couple intersections back off of um, Marion Quimby Road and Thompson Creek Road that were added, but they were the limits established by the county and the state as part of the scoping, so that's what we studied. Um, the TIS showed all new McDonald's trips entering and exiting the site from eastbound direction towards the roundabout along Thompson Creek Road. The study shows no trips from Route 8. Well, that's not true. If you look at the site generation, we have two different types of trips generated by a fast food restaurant. We have new trips, which are people that leave their home work or some specific use, go to the McDonald's, and then go right back to that place. That's a primary trip. And then there's what we call pass-by trips. They're the people that are already driving past the McDonald's that are now going to come off the road into McDonald's and come back out. The majority of our pass-by trips were taken from 50 in and back out to go east. The majority of our new trips were taken from the Route 8 corridor to the south or to the uh, Thompson Creek Rock Carter to the to the south and brought in McDonald's and back to those homes. Um, so we did factor traffic coming from Route 8 
Um, we didn't bring traffic from Route 8 to the north. As we figured if they were going to McDonald's, they go to the other McDonald's without crossing over the bridge. So most of our new trips from, for this McDonald's came from south on Route 8. Um, the peak hours shown in TIRS are not consistent with the shopping center peak hours. Also, the study does not count for the actual peak hour count time that exists beyond 6 to 7 p.m. Basically, these traffic studies are done to study the peak time of the adjacent road traffic. That means what's the peak of the traffic flowing through these key intersections. It's not the peak of a use in the shopping center. It's the peak of when the traffic's heaviest at these intersections. And that occurs typically between 4 and 6 on a weekday. And on a Saturday, typically occurs between 11 and 2 on a Saturday and Sunday. Historical data, we've been doing these counts in this area for a long time, and they've always fallen between there. Again, all our peak hours fell within the time periods we counted of the adjacent road system. And that's, that's what we're required to study, when traffic is peaked on the adjacent road. And finally, kind of the state highway ramps always have their right away at the intersection. I assume that was the roundabout. Oh, well, that's not true. The roundabout is set up for yield condition on all approaches. And it's signed for yield and conditions on all approaches. When you enter the roundabout, you have to yield to the person to your left, and then you go. So people on 50 do have to stop. They didn't have to stop before the roundabout was in there, but they certainly do stop now, and everyone yields to the person to the right. So that's, that's how that works. Person to the left. To the left. To the left. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> to the right. So, and then the last thing was the trip generation report again, and, I, and basically what our study showed with a bunch of numbers, and I know they, they're confusing, and we tried to make it as, and I don't think we did a good job of it again, but long and short of it, the existing McDonald's on Castle Marina Road generates a lot more trips during the AM than IT, gener than IT would, would estimate based on its square footage. And I think that's pretty reasonable considering the fact that there's really not a lot of competition along the westbound side of US 50 for fast food restaurants. You have the McDonald's and you have the Dunkin' Donuts and... With your traffic studies, don't you find that dual lane drive throughs are going to constantly start to show higher percentages? You know, we've, we've been working with McDonald's on a lot of sites through the state and the main reason they're doing the dual drive through is to try to keep their parking lots clear. Mm -hmm because they back up into it. They're not seeing a lot of growth in actual customer numbers with the dual drive-in. What they're, they're finding is, and what they're trying to do with this thing is to get their parking lots cleared up so that people can bit back in and out of their spaces better. So no, and there's not a lot of, these are relatively new type setups and there's not a lot of trip generation information on it. But we were doing a, a site in Bel Air for McDonald's recently and I know sales data is pretty tight to McDonald's, but we asked them to show us some before and afters of when before they put it in and after, and there's really no significant change in the number of trips coming to the store when there is a dual drive through So I think it's fairly understandable why the AM is higher over there, because lack of, I think, competition, and B, that's the direction of peak flow in the morning where people are going to work across the bridge and they're stopping at McDonald's because it's easy to get in and out. So I, I understand why it's probably higher there. PM, Saturday and Sunday, it's no different than what ITE would, would, would predict. Our side of the road, we don't really think we're going to have that bump from ITE average because on our side of the road, we have a McDonald's on the other side of the bridge in Anne Arundel County that you pass by if you're coming through. You have Kentucky Fried Chicken. You have... Uh, um, Burger King, you have Chick-fil-A, all along that same direction of corridor. So although it's understandable to me why the other side was heavy in the AM, I don't believe that that necessarily translates that we're going to be that much heavier in the AM. So I'm pretty comfortable with the projections that we've done, especially since we have didn't factor out the existing traffic that's going to be replaced. So, Just to be clear, if you do experience the same increase in traffic that the other McDonald has what what is that circle going to operate at what level? I mean it's at a capacity of 46 percent of its capacity well, volume to capacity ratio of point right now the the the, the lowest uh, volume of traffic of all the peak periods that Ken looked at is the AM is the AM 
I think that's what Jim yeah. teased out earlier. Right. Even if yeah. you have you're telling me that circle percent. could handle 2,600 cars an hour. No, not that one. No, but um, no, it it, it no. We have, have 46 percent, and I, it's going to. You know, if 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 we're if we're adding their peak trip, you were 1,045 and 274 is 1,319. Well, yeah, nine. well, we have we we have the 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 other mini roundabout mm -hmm. that, that was recently replaced by a new interchange um, up in Baltimore County, up uh, Charles Street, below an Avenue. That single lane mini roundabout handled roughly 2,400 vehicles in an hour. It was only put in as a temporary because we were experiencing high rates of crashes and um, from people running stop signs because they didn't want to wait to get stuck in a half mile queue. It took away the accidents. It allowed people to move. I mean, if you have three vehicles that enter, uh, get to the yield line all at the same time, all three can go at one time. Theoretically, you could all go at the same time. You can't do that at a stop location. Um, we had 2,400 vehicles, the highest peak hour. Were there four entries? No, there were only three entries. Which is probably worse. Yeah. <laughs> Which is worse than four, yeah. But. Can we get rid of that circle? I mean, not Can now. Get rid of the exit? There's to go back to what? <laughs> to go back, yeah, right. What, what do you want to do? I mean, we'd, we'd have to buy the gas happen? stations. Let me tell you what's going to happen. So and my neighbors are going to get up and say this. I'm going to save you the trouble. That's our only way home if you pass the first exit. There's going to be a wreck. And you know what? The entire island should not be happy about this because we're going to have to go down to one of the next two exits, turn around, and make traffic all the way back up the other side to go back over Route 8 and go down our own little secret way that God knows everyone's going to know. Because That's what's going to happen. Because of the McDonald's? Because the extra traffic at the circle, absolutely. Okay. I'll come to your house, Mr. Drummond, okay. and come hang out. Down. I guess I guess I don't agree. Yeah. I'd... Yeah, I'll come to your house then. Oh, okay. wait, you're way too far. That would be the really long straw for me. Ken, you want to go through? Because there's a couple of... The long straw is a good thing. Short straw means I have to go to Baltimore County. <laughs> I just want, if you could, could you touch a bit, uh, touch base on um, the center itself? You had evaluated uh, yeah. the parking layout, the, the, the uh, dual islands, and so on, and there was some discussion at the last planning commission. Although I don't think that was your focus for today, but I, I would like you to touch it. Well, I mean, the, the configuration we're setting up with this McDonald's is pretty much a mirror image of what's been operating and working well with Kentucky Fried Chicken. I mean, it's almost the same configuration. The, the round of, the, the drive-through goes around. The Kentucky Fried Chicken comes out close to the main access for the shopping center out onto the service road and needs no special signing, needs no special marking. It's the rules of the road. People understand what to do. I think that this configuration is, going, is just like that, very similar to what's down at the Taco Bell and the other um, fast foods. And we've worked with many, many shopping centers with pad sites out front. And that's how they're set up. And there's different people, believe it or not, when people are driving in a parking lot, they drive differently than when they're driving down a collector road and when they're driving on an on a, um, expressway. They expect pedestrians to be walking out of their cars and carrying bags and kids in hand, and they drive differently. I mean, you just have a different sense when you enter a parking lot that think the rules are different than where, when you were driving across the Bay Bridge. So people get used to these conditions, and they, they've obviously been able to drive this configuration at Kentucky Fried Chicken well, and that probably has more volume up at that intersection than we do down at this intersection part of the shopping center. Why would you be concerned about putting a bunch of signage and stop signs and all that in there in the parking lot? I mean, what, what effect would that have? If, if well, if Mike can attest to this because me and Mike worked at the state many years ago, and we worked under the toolage of Mr. Tom Hicks, who who was the main traffic engineer in the state of Maryland for 40 years before he just retired. And his mantra to all of us was always the least control is the best control. That you don't artificially put up stop signs and crosswalks and stop bars and all these kind of things unless you really need them. Because people tend to know how to drive without that kind of guidance. And if you put them up when they're not necessary, then people say, well, why don't I have to stop here? And they just roll through it. And then when you really want them to stop at a stop sign, they don't know if you really want them to stop or it's one of those fake ones that you're supposed to roll through. So the least control was always the best control and there's no, uh, I don't believe there's any 
indication that it's not going to work well. But if it doesn't and there starts to be some problems, then you implement those type of things. Then you say, okay, well, I do have – there is some misunderstanding of how they're supposed to come out of this drive aisle. And we're going to have to put some markings and signings and some information to, to tell them how to do it correctly. But you don't do that until you need it. When you studied the existing McDonald's during the peak hour or any other time, was there ever a time that traffic – backed up outside of their parking lot onto the street? I believe there was, yes. Idea how many cars that was or how? No, was I just remember the counter saying it was very busy and and people were back, backed out while people were trying to negotiate around the entrance, yeah. So wouldn't that create an unusual condition that should have been noted? Yeah, and it was noted on my count. But there was no documentation of how many cars and how long that condition lasted. Yeah, it was it was sporadic, and they and from what I I talked to the to the woman who did the count, and she said it was sporadic, but it cleared up pretty quickly. But it did happen, and it is pretty tight around the entrances, right off of the the stop sign, and then sort of circle around and come back the out way. So it is a little bit a little bit of an unusual situation over there. But they are carrying and during that peak time, they're carrying a lot of traffic. You guys have anything else? I don't unless you have any okay. questions. I'd first. like to bring up Sheriff Hoffman. See him in the back. Can I ask a question while the sheriff's on his way up? Is not for you, gentlemen. Uh, the last meeting I asked what the proposed hours were going to be, and it was 24-7. Does the can the county give limitations to that at all? I don't think we have any ordinance that allows us to do that. Unless you could make a, find, a, a proper finding of fact that there's some uh, health, safety, or welfare reason from a zoning perspective that would militate against what has been proposed. Welcome, Sheriff Hoffman. Thank you for coming. Good morning. I have a couple questions for you. At, at our last meeting, um, the one person who testified uh, purported to have your permission to quote you as saying that if McDonald's was built, people would die in this circle. Is that an accurate statement? And not of obesity. That is uh, that is not 100 percent accurate. We were, we were uh, on a cell phone. I'm sure there was some uh, misinformation <laughs> that was relayed. The exact comment I made uh, when we spoke was is that we, we know of two fatal crashes that occurred on Thompson Creek Road. Um, they were not at that traffic circle, but one was a child struck on a bicycle uh, near the Kmart, and there was another one, I'm sorry, near the food line. There was another one also where an elderly lady was T-boned when she was coming out of Kmart and was killed. Those are the two. Um, I did also receive, uh, I'm not an engineer, have no experience with traffic circles, and you heard testimony previous from those experts, but from a law enforcement perspective, um, we were requested to provide data on traffic crashes that had occur occurred at the circle, and Chris Drummond was in receipt of that letter from my office. And, and that letter indicated that you have, I don't know whether yours or, or state police indicated they had like two or three reported accidents since that was built, and yes. you guys had about the same? We did. Since 2000, and, I'm sorry, in the past seven years, there were only three crashes there. One required a motor vehicle report that we were contacted for. The other two were uh, property damage accidents that didn't require reports and two of the three accidents occurred between 11:44 a.m. and 1:22 p.m. How do we jive that with abundant testimony that there are frequent accidents there? Well, How does at, that happen? As uh, as stated by somebody earlier from your board, a lot of times there I can't attest this. This is purely speculation and it would have to be brought up by the persons involved in those crashes, but a lot of times there are fender bender crashes that do occur and most people remove their vehicles from the roadway in order to avoid uh, you know, traffic issues and settle the issues themselves unless it's a serious property damage crash or a personal injury crash. So a lot of times crashes do go unreported. But not ones where there's any injury? Not Most of the time, no. When there's an injury, there's somebody who wants to make a report. What What else can you tell us about that circle, if anything, that's pertinent here? Is there any public safety issue with a, with a fast food restaurant? What, I mean, we, we're limited in what we're, our ability is to do here, and I'm just wondering well, your opinion. In on all that. fairness, as, as the chief law enforcement officer, I can only present you with data and not speculation. Um, what I went ahead and did was pulled data to comparable 
um, after speaking with, um, I don't recall the gentleman's name, but the proposed owner of the new McDonald's, uh, one thing that I thought I would do in all fairness to everybody was to, and I presented a copy to Mr. Stevens earlier, and I do have a copy for you guys if you want, um, you can pass this around. was to look at uh, from January 1st, 2010 to June 30th of this year, was to look at calls for service at um, different places. They didn't seem to be exceptionally high. Uh, McDonald's was one of our higher volume between Centerville and Chester, uh, our higher volume in calls for service. But when you look at this, the only things that stand out um, are proactive and reactive calls for service, being things like uh, disturbance calls or disturbance calls. I mean, thefts are, thefts are minimal compared to the volume uh, of traffic that they generate uh, and employees that they employ, thefts are minimal. Um, it looks like a lot of things, more things are reported for those two. So we looked at Burger King, McDonald's in Centerville, McDonald's in Chester, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Hardee's in Centerville, as well as Stevensville, and also Taco <coughs> Bell, which is a Kentown market. As well as in that packet to supply the letters of request from uh, Chris to. Can I just ask a clarification question? So I understand. The Please do. On, on, on this list. And I'm sorry. And I, let me make a clarification that, and you're you're very right on what you're going to ask me. The um, the June January 1st, 2010 to June 30th, 2013, is sheriff's office reported calls for service. On the back of that, where it says McDonald's Chester, which is in a different format, uh, more of a paragraph format with bolded points, that is actually the data that I received from the Maryland State Police, which is a, they evaluate their data a little bit differently than we did. So there are two, two different law enforcement agencies reporting on data for the similar sites. And what's the time period of 2010 to 2013? Correct, and, and Maryland State Police only did 2011, 12, and 13. So in 2013, between the Chester and the Centerville McDonald's, you had <coughs> seven calls, and those were all in Centerville? That's what Maryland State Police has reported, yes. And what, and, and so there were none down, I mean all in Chester, not in Centerville, none in Centerville. Okay. According, you're reading from the Maryland State Police no, document? From your document. No, that's, that's, that's the data collected from the Maryland State Police. Oh, that's Maryland State Police, okay. Yes. Okay. And, um, and the seven calls in Chester. Are we looking at the MSPs? MSPs, yes, I apologize. Thank just you. for no, clarification to the board. I was just trying to keep up with where y'all were. MSP would be the uh, bulleted format uh, typed. Ours is on an Excel data sheet. Okay, that's a good search. Okay. And do, do you know how many calls you get from the current restaurant for any disturbances or DWIs or anything like that? The current restaurant, uh, no, we didn't, we compared them differently. They would be compared with um, like Rustico or other restaurants like that, a little bit different in nature because of drive throughs Looks like KFC in Stevensville alarm doesn't work very well. <laughs> that, is, that is an alarming number there actually and it's something we need to meet with them on. They actually uh, should be charged with, uh, yeah. with so, the alarm so, law. Um, Is there some, anything, I mean, it looks like there's disturbances and calls for help and calls for sick people and calls for abandoned cars and calls for stuff everywhere. Is there, is there any, um, anything about McDonald's that is any different than any other fast food restaurant? Um, we, we tried to evaluate everything with very similar demographics as far as, uh, and I'm not an expert in fast food restaurants, um, looking at the demographics as far as, you know, drive throughs uh, student, you know, students that are young people that may attend it or uh, things like that. Um, nothing really, you know, the number stands out. They, they are a higher volume. The numbers that stands out is the disturbance calls. We do see a lot of times, uh, you know, loitering, things like that in the, uh, in those, but I mean, they're a higher volume. <coughs> so. Sheriff, are any of these open 24 hours a day? I couldn't tell you that. I didn't actually analyze the hours. I thought I recalled Burger King. Wendy's was 20, 24 this, hours. This, this one it? is 24 hours, isn't it? I think the Burger Chester. King. 
Isn't that the one in Centerville, 24 hours? Oh, it has one? extended yeah. during yeah. summer. Yeah, it's Chester's 24, 24 hours. Yeah. yeah, this one is too. Okay. The one in Chester is 24 hours a day. And in Centerville, which I love when I've been out in D.C. and come back and get to go through the drive through for a burger. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you make it up here and don't stop at my circle. <laughs> Through your circle of plenty too. Yeah, and remember, when, in, in all fairness, in all fairness to every business that's represented here, there are proactive and reactive responses. You know, proactive being the police officer patrolling through the neighborhood, and reactive from the business taking that step to make the call before they see an incident occurring. So, there, are, you know. Well, I would assume that that is somewhat reflected here, and that McDonald's has more calls for assistance and suspicious people, but no more for assault or burglary or robbery or anything else that's that is very Not correct as yes. actual crimes necessarily happening because of mcdonald's is i mean shannon wants to beat somebody up she's not going to go to mcdonald's specifically because it's mcdonald's to do it correct unless they mess up her circle that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly okay. did you hear my statement about there's going to be an accident there and your people aren't going to be able to come down and help my neighbors you're going to have to go all the way back around just like we are because there's no other way if you miss that first exit at Route 8. I, kn I know your secret shortcut. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other questions for the Sheriff? I'd like to know the secret shortcut. I no. think we ought to disclose no. that. We're putting it on our Facebook page later today. <laughs> <laughs> there goes my friend. Okay. Um, <laughs> Deep friend. Thank you. I, there were a few comments from the public last time they offered to provide us some information and instead of eating into those people's time where if they have comment this I, i'd like to call up a couple people if they're here and ask them for a follow-up on those particular things first one um mr rudy if he's here he offered a study to us to my knowledge we did not receive one or is he he's not here okay um mr stower Mr. Stowe, you, you indicated that um, McDonald's generates three to five times more traffic than similar restaurants, and you were going to provide us, I asked you to provide us with specifics, and you did provide us a follow-up. I did. What I got out of your follow-up was pretty much just that Montgomery County does it differently, and what we should do is get actual counts, which, 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 which we did request at the last meeting. So I'm just wondering if there's something more that you would like to comment on that specific, not in general, you'll get your three minutes, but on, on the specific of um, your, your, uh, your follow-up to they generate more traffic than other fast foods. I asked that question specifically, um, and that gets into the issue of, of trying to do counts and getting into the, looking at, at invoices and stuff like that in Dolopha. And I did not get my hands on anything specific that I could share with you. Uh, but there are some articles. I don't have the citations. I think the most recent one was in um, uh, Bloomberg Business Week, uh, which was a discussion of what does the dual ordering stations at a McDonald's do for McDonald's business. And um, I heard the discussion earlier. Uh, and the answer is it, it improves the efficiency of, of, the, of the restaurant itself. <clears throat> People tend to be a little bit time consuming and indecisive in placing orders and so that the, the cooks can actually cook faster than orders can be taken. So that the dual stations moves more people through the facility. Um, they interviewed a number of people working in different McDonald's and so that there is some percentage increase in flow uh, due to the uh, dual ordering facilities. And that was sort of a nationwide review. M McDonald's is going that way. A lot of the other fast food places are watching McDonald's very carefully. So there is some uh, uh, increase. In terms of the discussion that you had uh, earlier with Mr. Schmid, uh, the point that I would make is that I, I agree with uh, Ms. McClellan's um, um, question about eastbound traffic flows. Uh, the, flow peak, the flow peaks eastbound and westbound on Route 50 are very much a function of people going to the ocean for the weekend or for a two-week or one-week uh, condo rental. And so that they... The, understanding how those flows differ so that 
doing the count of the westbound um, uh, McDonald's in Chester may not necessarily be representative of what the flows would look like on the eastbound side uh, in at the at the uh, Stevensville um, Thompson Creek location. Um, but wouldn't the peak be just on a different day? When the same number, I mean, same number of people go to Ocean City. Generally speaking, with a few exceptions, the same number of people come back. No, I, I, yes, but the but the the time the time of when those peaks occur and and the concentration of those peaks would be different. They'd have different sine waves if you if you mapped them out uh, for a variety of reasons that I don't think we need to beat to death right now. But but the point is that the the, the Chester counts may not be be fully representative of what the counts might look like. An, an alternative would be to look at the counts uh, of the existing McDonald's over near the Wawa on, uh, no, it's not, it's not by the Wawa, uh, just east of uh, Cape St. Clair Road, uh, where people actually have to make a U-turn to get in there uh, or go through the Wawa and come up over St. Clair Road. Anyhow, the, 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 the traffic density, the traffic counts at that facility would be worth knowing because they actually have a huge parking lot. They, in fact, get a lot of buses in there, uh, and, they, and they are, that's a huge McDonald's in terms of the amount of inside eating space, and, and I don't know if they've gone to two, I think there are two ordering stations now as well. So if you were going to do a count, but, but the counts are only one thing, and in, in the email that I, I sent to you, uh, and talking with two of the planners and doing some research in Montgomery County, um, they said that traffic counts are one consideration, but the more important and equally important consideration in terms of citing a fast food restaurant is particularly if they're in or near a shopping center, is what is the proximity of the entrance and exit from the, the, uh, the facility compared to other neighboring exits. So that, for example, the, there's a Sunoco station uh, immediately adjacent to or cl very close to within 100 yards of, of the, uh, um, uh, the McDonald's. And so that there's, you'll have tr traffic turning into the Sunoco, you'll have other traffic turning across the Thompson Creek access road uh, to get into the McDonald's. So that's a, compared to the existing table service restaurant, there will be a f far more traffic cutting, turning left but, off. But, of but just to be specific, um, what you indicated was that McDonald's was five to six times what ITE said, and you didn't find anything that 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 you gave us that that shows that. You so also suggested that we should have them do a count of a actual restaurant, which we did in, in Chester. Is that dual lane drive through as mm -hmm. well? Yes. Yes. It is. Okay. So my question is. What more, and the reason I'm asking you and giving you a lot more time than we're going to give other people is that Mr. Storr was the chairman of a traffic study committee in another county, and that doesn't mean that they know any more than we do, but it does mean that he might have a little more information that would help us. So, so what I'm hearing from you now is if there were a study of the traffic across the bridge and that McDonald's is okay, that you'd be okay with McDonald's going here. Is that, is that accurate? Or, or that, that is, no, that's in a standalone location more or less. It, it does not have the same kind of competing traffic demands of this particular McDonald's, which is located in a shopping center, the Thompson Creek Shopping Center, and is ad adjacent to a, a couple of gas stations as well, a Shell and, and a Sunoco. So, that the, the, so there, are, there are fewer traffic conflicts at the McDonald's on the other side, but at least would give you an idea of what the, it would give you a different set of numbers than the n numbers that you get from the McDonald's in Chester. Uh, the, so that the point that the planners made to me was, they also talked about the ITE estimates, and, 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 and both of them have experience with ITE. ITE is located right in downtown Washington on, on I Street. Uh, the, um, uh, they felt that the, the county, Montgomery County, uh, actually, and, and I think Prince George's as well, but Montgomery County uh, actually requests uh, counts on comparable traffic of comparable roads at the, at, now they're less seasonal. So <coughs> any counts that we would ask for here would have to take into the seasonal characteristics of traffic on Route 50 going to and from the ocean uh, because that's a large part of the business that some of the fast food places get. Would that well, be not accounted for in an August traffic 
account? I was, you know, Holly ran off about eight or nine count days. Only one of those eight or nine count days was a, a weekend in August. And, and she mentioned there's also a count in June, June 22nd and 23rd, I think were the dates that she mentioned. That's actually before the summertime peak. Uh, so I wouldn't I would discount that a little bit as well. So with all the energy that they put into doing those traffic counts, I'm not sure that they were sufficiently representative from seasonal traffic flows well, and seasonal I, traffic I'd like peaks. to interject something there. Uh, we keep going back to this count. We, we just heard the state, you know, and I'm not for or against, but I just want to clarify this. We just heard the state say, even if that count was off and it was five times higher, that's still an A-rated circle. So I, so my, my point is... Actually, my, I have enough background in transportation to know that uh, traffic circles generally fall in the category of traffic calming devices. They slow people down. Mm -hmm. and, so, and they made the point mm -hmm. that they're safer than, uh, than signalized or uh, stop sign intersection because people slow down. They're doing 10 or 15 or 20 going around the circle. So if there's a fender bender, it's a scratch and doesn't get reported. And so, and, but you get enough of those, people are not going to be happy with fender benders all over the place. Uh, but I'm trying to back away from the count issue and get into the other issue of trying to shoehorn a high volume fast food uh, restaurant into a shopping center situation that has competing traffic requirements, whether it's for the post office, Ace Hardware, uh, Luke's, a number of other places. Uh, what I'm going to do now, you're getting into a whole different topic than the question I asked to give you your ex this extra I time here, so that. you may make those comments during your three minutes. Okay. If there are any other questions dealing specifically with traffic counts that Mr. Story brought up earlier. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Now we're going to open it up for public comment. We're going to go through the people that are on this list. You're going to have three minutes each. When you get to uh, uh, 10 seconds from the end of your three minutes, you're going to hear a warning from Barbara. And at three minutes, uh, I am going to do something. <laughs> you're going to hit that little tone and you will know that you are done. The only way that we can be fair to everyone is for everyone to stick with three minutes. If one person takes four minutes, that means someone else didn't get their extra minute and didn't have as much influence on that. So we're going to go through everybody that's signed up. After that, if there's other people that wish to speak, you're welcome to come up and speak on, uh, on this topic. The first is Lisa, uh, Lisa Napoli. Suzanne Hogan. Nick Stower afterwards. If, if you, the next person would come up while this person is speaking, that would be helpful. Um, good morning, Suzanne Hogan, Stevensville. Um, I want to um, continue the theme that we seem to be on, which is traffic and traffic safety around that circle. Uh, I found it very enlightening to hear that that mini circle was one of only two in the state. If I understood the state highway uh, representative correctly, it's now the only one because the other one, which was set up as a temporary solution, has now been replaced by a by a signalized That's intersection. Correct. Okay, so the uniqueness by a larger of roundabout. They, they replace it with a larger roundabout? Uh, no, sir. No, no. It was put in as a temporary configuration until the interchange could be rebuilt. Okay. okay. Gotcha. That temporary was supposed to be five years. It lasted 12. Thank you. So, uh, so but, I... It, but one more thing. It's not the I'll only give you more roundabout. Time. Thank sorry. you. It's not the only mini roundabout in the state. It's the only one that state highway is built. There are many mini roundabouts in the state of Maryland. Okay, well, I, I, I'm going to stick to what he shared with us, which has to do with the uniqueness of this mini intersection, this mini uh, circle, the size, the configuration, the absence of these, the mounted component to deal with truck traffic. Um, I, I share, I believe, what is Commissioner McClellan's concern, which is I do not think that we've effectively captured the impact that Saturday high volume peak traffic is going to have um, for traffic coming off of Route 50 eastbound um, and competing with local traffic and the traffic that may be exiting said McDonald's. Um, I know the numbers I've seen in the past, last time I looked at it, something like 55,000 cars. I think you mentioned 60,000 cars. Um, that that is a that is a huge monstrous volume of traffic and it is exiting at a high speed um and anyone who has traveled through that intersection which i think a large number of people in this road have done so have seen horrendous things happen there i mean i have watched tractor trailers come through there uh, at a high rate of speed with zero concern for who else is in that circle and maybe entering the circle and drive directly across it a straight 90 degree angle boom boom high speed 
I, d I do not see how the needs of the community, particularly from a public safety um, and traffic safety, um, are served by even taking a chance um, at introduction. Because uh, it, it sounds to me as if the state highways went with the solution of the mini circle there because there was no other remedy that could be applied in that situation. So worst case scenario is that we are wrong, that these estimates that we're getting are wrong, that it, it will far exceed the ability of the circle to handle traffic exiting off of Route 50 at a high rate of speed safely and that we begin to see fatalities there. I anecdotally anticipate that that's what we will see. So what will be our recourse? What will we do? We will have a business entity that will be looking to see traffic um, enter it, uh, and and is there is there a meaningful remedy? I think if there was a remedy, we would have already seen it, um, and I I do not want to see us go down this path. Um, we have a McDonald's that currently seeks serves uh, Ken Island and its residents. Um, I do not think it it is it is any better served by the introduction of another one. Uh, and, and I think, indeed, the placing it there would put our local community at great peril. Thank you. Thank you. After uh, Mr. Storer would be Terry Kidwell. Go right ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> I guess I, I would make the point that I was trying to make uh, a few minutes ago on the, the secondary issues of, of the proximity of the McDonald's to the shopping center uh, and the access into it. So in order to get into the McDonald's, um, people are going to have to come off of the circle, they head westbound on the service road, then turn left across the service road into the McDonald's. Um, that, I think, is a more serious accident-prone setting where you're going to have uh, head-ons or turning accidents as people turn across or, or possibly even get backed up going into the, the, the McDonald's. And so you then have westbound traffic on, on the service road uh, creating a problem. Um, uh, whether you just eliminate McDonald's totally or the alternative will be to put in a mini circle down by the KFC. Uh, there's an entrance in there. Um, and that would slow down traffic both eastbound and westbound on the service road. So there's another traffic calming device that could be uh, put in on that service road to make to keep people from, from diving at 50 miles an hour from Kmart down to the Thompson Creek Circle uh, and going past the McDonald's. Um, but the turning traffic into the shopping center, turning traffic uh, in and around uh, McDonald's and, and, and turn, turning in. And the other concern that I have, and I've got my three minutes, is if you're coming down Route 50, if you see ours, it doesn't mean anything to you. But if all of a sudden you're driving down Route 50 and you see a sign that says McDonald's, you say, aha, they've got a new McDonald's here, people are going to shift gears, literally and figuratively, to pull off quickly off of Route 50 to see the new, to go into the new McDonald's. So they're going to, so that, and now you'll probably have two years of experience of going through that process. I think that will add to traffic, add to complications at the traffic circle, and just create havoc in that, that particular area and even looking through the trees that are, that are in the median there. Um, I'm not going to say anything else. That's, that's, those are my comments. Okay. Uh, after Ms. Kidwell will be uh, Jody Gray. Hello. My name is Terry Kidwell from Stevensville. And my concern is that I did witness a traffic study take place on June the 25th through June the 27th. And I do have on a zip drive where I videoed the traffic study, and I also took pictures um, at, the interse um, at the entrances, all three entrances to the shopping center, and, and where the traffic study took place. I don't know who did it, but it was there. And I also um, took two videos of the traffic circle, showing that there were no strips there to count cars during this traffic study that was done that particular week. And in my video, um, there was a car, Stop 150, dead stop, back up to enter the circle, which is what we experience living on Ken Island more than once a day. So that's, that's my, my concern. And like I said, I have pictures also on my, my zip drive here um, that shows the parking lot of the shopping center that the McDonald's would be in. There would not be enough parking spaces for the other businesses there in the McDonald's. For instance, the post office takes 16 parking spots. 
Monday through Friday from 5 p.m. until the next business day, say it be 8 p.m. Then Saturday noon when the post office closes until again they open up Monday morning. That's 16 spots. Also, there are two designated spots in that um, parking, parking lot for Domino's. That there are signs, which I have pictures on here, that there's two spots for Domino's delivery drivers. And also there are pictures here that show that the Domino drivers and people picking up food from Domino's, they can't park anywhere because there's no parking now in the in the parking lot. They double park, they cause a danger, there's a hazard right there at the Domino's, the Luke's and you know, right there at that that section where there would be that double lane drive through going from one end of the building, wrap around and coming out the other side. So um uh, like I said, I, ha I have pictures here. I really don't know how to put them on your computer so you can see them, but they're here for the commissioners to see. Did you email us? Did I email you pictures? No, ma'am. So did I you email us a, um, an email saying about the traffic study and the strips? Was that you? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, one other question. Sure. Were you here the last meeting? Yes, ma'am. And you heard us discuss the post office and their vehicles and the parking? I, I honestly, no, I didn't. Okay. Now, I'm not sure if it was just like a gentleman's agreement for them to park there, but like I said, I just counted the, the trucks that are there that take up spaces for other businesses. And I do want to make one more comment. I do not think the KFC is a double lane drive through. It's a single lane drive through. So that's incorrect there. So it's not the same. It's not the same. So thank you. So if you would like my zip drive. If you'd like to leave it for us, you're welcome to do so. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, after uh, Ms. Gray would be Cindy Hughes. Where do you want me to be? No. Hey, Luke. I'm sorry. I'm She's my prop. <laughs> my name's Jody Gray. I live in Stevensville. And one of the things that I've done um, over the last couple of months is become educated about your process and the fact that you volunteer to serve our county, and we do appreciate that. Um, but we, we'd like to bring to the attention to summarize all the emails and input that you've gotten from the county or from the citizens that this is really a stipulation as to what you, you hold your projects up against. And I'd like to make note of a couple of things. Um, item number one, um, there's nothing but concern for the increased traffic hazards and safety concerns for drivers, pedestrians, and bikers. You've received information from many citizens who have, and, and a citizen who's an expert on the topic. Item number two, parking is not currently adequate at times uh, in the current situ in the situation, which provides a, a glimpse at what will be commonplace occurrence during beach season. I have pictures of the parking lot being completely full, which forces people to park along the curbs, in the travel lanes, and even in the red fire lanes. Um, all of those, th those round things that you see there on the map, people will park along those, and so there's one lane of traffic to get through because we do not have enough parking um, in, in, the, in this mall as, we, as it stands. I would also note that the Food Lion parking lot is not owned by, by Hyatt Commercial, is not part of what can be considered overflow for people that need to use the services at this particular mall. That is not uh, part of the, of the shopping uh, center. Um, item number four, there's a very real concern for property values to be affected. Access to one's homes is critical to potential buyers and the neighborhood feel of the current mall will be altered. Um, item number six, regarding the character of the community. Um, I have no idea how many letters of support that you've, uh, you've received for this project, but I know that you've received hundreds and hundreds of statements from, from people who live here to be against this project. The character of this community will be affected, and that is one of the items that is supposed to be satisfied in order for you to approve a project. Finally, I would like to comment on behalf of approximately 10,000 or so people that live on the island, including children, um, that uh, the, the statements that were made during the last meeting that were underserved by having one McDonald's, we are insulted by that statement. To think that we believe that we are underserved is ridiculous. Um, this is nothing more than a service to be provided for beach traffic for the 200,000 cars that come across that bridge. That is what this is for. And we are not willing to sacrifice our community, the spirit of our community, for this particular project. This project is too big to squeeze in, I like the term shoehorn, into this particular mall. And on behalf of, of everybody who does live here, who is adequately served by the McDonald's that we currently have, I respectfully request that you do not give permission to jam this project into the Thompson Creek Mall. Thank you. Okay, after uh, Deborah Hayward is Diane Bedlin. 
Cindy. Cindy Hughes. Cindy. Yes. yes. Sorry. Um, I'm just here to speak on behalf of the children. As you heard, we did have one child killed on that service road. Knowing children, I have seven grandchildren that live, four in Love Point, three in Bay City. They go to Mattapeak, the high school, and uh, Bayside. They will ride their bikes, use their skateboards to go to this new McDonald's. As it is, Route 8 is a death trap. It's getting worse every day. Um, I have to come out on Irene Way. Well, I don't have to. I should go down to the light, but I do. It's very dangerous. And these children will attempt to get there one way or the other. Mom and dad are working. A lot of them are home by themselves during the summer. Even if they're told no, they'll do it. We all know they'll do it. And you're going to have a lot of problems. The kids aren't adequately um, served on this county as it is. And that's all I really have to say. I just don't want to see another child killed. By the way, I've almost been struck twice in that little circle, one time on a motorcycle, so it would have been a deadly one. So that's it. Hey, Judy Monger will be next. Mr. Trenred. Hello, Deborah Hayward, Stevensville. As the owner of a waterfront home off of Thompson Creek Road, I have a number of reasons I believe a McDonald's at the proposed location is not a good choice, but I will focus today on safety um, and traffic and quality of life. Someone asked about traffic um, on the Bay Bridge. Maryland Transportation Authority's website says fiscal year 2011, the traffic volume was 27.1 million vehicles crossing over the Bay Bridge each year. Um, just to have a piece of data there. And I can certainly respect and appreciate the people who traveled to this area from outside of the area on, I believe it was five days and looked at traffic for a couple of hours. But I live at 365 days a year. Um, so you can choose to listen to someone who came and looked at traffic for a couple of hours, or you can listen to someone who lives it day in, day out, every day, holidays, weekends, when there are accidents and other places. Um, the number of near misses in that circle where I've had to slam on my brakes and my child's food has fallen out of her hand and spilled all over the car because someone coming off of 50, going 65 miles an hour, does not know they need to slow down, yield, stop at that intersection to someone circling around. And I've had to slam on my brakes as a result because these people are unfamiliar with our local traffic patterns. It's very unusual to come off from a road going 55 with a very short ramp heading right into a circle. Additionally, once motorists navigate the traffic circle, if there's then a backup due to individuals not being able to get through the drive through the backup cars have nowhere to go. They're going to go on the road. Well, you know, traveling local roads when Route 50 is clogged with beach traffic is challenging enough without adding more congestion. And A rating is meaningless to people who live here if we can't get where we need to go to live our daily lives, particularly on Fridays, during which no traffic um, study was done when we're traveling after a long week of work um, and Sunday evenings when people are coming back. So um, I encourage you to find another location that's more adequately um, able to service the traffic volume that this will create. Thank you. Sidebar, Thursdays is the new Fridays coming off the bridge too. Or trying to get to the bridge. Okay. Um, <coughs> Diane Bedlin, somehow we got out of order. Just second. And uh, Norman Cotton would be the next. Oh, Jody, you need to come on up. Just come up and sit I'm down sorry, there. I was coming up and I thought she was ahead of me. Somehow we got out of order there. It's okay. <laughs> Not in a bad way. <laughs> uh, good morning. My name is Diane Bedlin, a resident of Cloverfields on Kent Island and creator and operator of the Kent Island Farmers Market. I am opposed to the McDonald's uh, for the following reasons. I have watched my beautiful island over the past 20 plus years turn into everyday um, every town in America, losing its identity and small town charm. I never thought when I moved here I would have to fight to keep small business alive and fight disconnected corporate entities. The short-sightedness environmental implications of bulldozing that completely fine building is absurd. The traffic, I mean everybody's talked about the traffic at the circle since Cracker Barrels come in I, it's just, it's horrendous. I don't, I don't want to take too much time on that. Last night, I did go to Tuesday morning. I had to circle around the parking lot for about five minutes to get a parking spot. And that's just the way it is right now. With all the post office 
um, vehicles there and everything. I don't understand why we need three McDonald's within a five mile, five mile r radius of each other, especially when there would be two on one side just a few miles apart. McDonald's is not for us, the citizens of Ken Island. We don't want it. I put this project up on my market's Facebook page. I have never gotten more comments and more information. I believe um, you commented on it on it as well um, from people. So I do have, I, I can talk for other people who I know can't be here because of the, the time of your, uh, y y your meeting. Um, and I think that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. And after Judy would, would be Norman. I'm Judy Monger. Um, a lot of my questions were answered, um, but I would like to elaborate on the, I recently saw an article in the, uh, I guess the, I don't know the, <laughs> what paper it was, but anyway, about the cloisters, which is going in kind of behind the Kmart on that farm, which will be a 240 unit senior development. Um, I found out that they will be going out that Kent Manor in drive which has a yield so I'm coming up route 8 people are coming out there they want to go into my lane I want to go into their lane because I'm going to go to the shopping center I would say that most of the seniors since I am a senior who would be coming out of there would tend to stay in that yield lane go up to the light turn into the shopping center if they're going to be going east or, or the drive whatever you call that shopping center drive to go east which would put them into the traffic circle also when uh, mr. Jerry was here last time he mentioned several times he's partnering with Jody Schultz I don't know Jody Schultz and I just wonder what the significance of, of that remark was I don't even what <laughs> reference I, I, think it was in I think it was in reference to being serviced. Not oh, with the fire department. To being served by, by the fire department. department. Actually, I believe Title 18, either 141 or 162, specifically requires that developers contact the local fire departments yes. uh, oh, okay. to comply with county code. Oh, but he said so, partnered. That kind of. Well, the, had the intent of that is to give the fire department an opportunity to ask for a donation. Okay. Oh, okay. And um, also. Um, well, he also mentioned that he was a small business owner, but I just read recently where he has eight or nine McDonald's, so I wouldn't consider I that a small that business yeah. owner. Um, and with regards to the, to the um, I checked the, the McDonald's down here at Centerville, and the amount of room that's between the actual McDonald's, which has its own little section there, I counted 24 spaces back to the other stores. Now, I'm not good at distances, but say at eight, eight foot wide, that would be 192 feet plus the little two-lane road behind the McDonald's and the two-lane road in front of the stores, which actually makes it a separate entity. Where the one at, at uh, Thompson Creek, <clears throat> when you go out of the building that's there now, you have to be careful because that's where people are driving. There's two, and that, and then the stores are on the other side of that. So, okay. So I think that that makes it, you know, a little different. And you're going to have two lanes coming around that building. So, thank Ms. you, Munger, Mr. Jerry and Mr. Schultz. I think is still here. Is he in the back? They're both here. Okay. And Mr. Schultz is with the fire department. Okay. Despite that you don't know him. I heard so his that, name, I just didn't that know. That was the partnership in quotations okay. that you are referencing. Okay. Mr. I, Jerry is the small business owner. Okay. My, I just, I, I now you know, know all the players. Okay. Okay, next will be Kimberly Mills after Mr. Cotton. Go right ahead. A couple statements. Uh, you asked how many cars a day go through there, cross the bridge. It's 290,000 cars a day. That wasn't difficult to find. Uh, when I come home at night, I go past that intersection. And whenever there is a incident in the circle, and it's certainly a lot more than one every five years, there's an incident in that circle, it backs traffic up on Route 50. It's identical to the way traffic gets backed up in front of the mall on the other side of the, the bridge. If, it didn't, if that isn't one of the most dangerous things I ever saw in my life. So 
I think that is a big consideration. And the other thing is, when they built the uh, McDonald's, or they fixed Route 50 on the other side, both McDonald's, who did have straight access on and off, no longer had that. They didn't put circles in there. They, they put roads that led somewhere else to access it. There wasn't direct access on and off Route 50, and that is where your problem comes. So I have. Okay, Ms. Mills is the last of the people who signed up. If there's anyone else who'd like to speak one at a time, you can come up while she's speaking The uh, as a seat is empty uh, next to whoever's speaking. The next person can come up and sit next to them, so go right ahead. Hi, um, my name is Kimberly Mills. I'm a resident of Queen Anne's County. Um, I also work at Ars Mayor Cantina. Um, I just want to share with you a little bit about the traffic that occurs on a daily basis in the shopping center. Um, I worked last night and Wednesday night is not our particularly busy night. Um, I worked from five to close and I can tell you that almost all the parking spaces in the shopping center were, were full. Um, some people could not find a parking spot so they actually lined up on the curb in front of the um, restaurant. The Domino's delivery drivers were lined up on the back so that makes one lane coming in front of the restaurant and one lane coming from the back for traffic to go either in or out. So there could potentially be a oncoming disaster if there are large vehicles parked there or um, if you just simply turn the corner and cannot see these vehicles. Um, I have also been into two small accidents in that shopping center. One I was backed up into, the other was a side swipe, um, $1,200 worth of damage to my vehicle. Um, and it's just, it's so crazy to try to find a parking spot even to get to work. Sometimes I have to park as far as the food line parking lot. You can't find a parking spot. Um, you can't really account for the food line parking lot because sometimes people do go there and park um, to get their groceries. But also, our busy nights are Thursday nights, Friday nights, and Sunday nights. So I've seen when the traffic is backed up on the Bay Bridge, people cannot find a parking spot. They actually start to park on the side of the road where the little access road is on the shoulder. Um, tractor trailer drivers park there too. So I think it would be pretty hazardous for the McDonald's to operate a drive through and um, a regular fast food restaurant with all the traffic that is there currently without seeing the McDonald's. And that's all I have to say. I don't, I don't mean to dispute anything that you've said, but I ate at Luke's last night. I got there about 545 and I got a parking spot immediately. Yeah. Um, no offense to ours. I love ours. Right. It depends. It really depends on what time you come. Um, last I night. Understand. Yeah. Last night I worked at like from five to close and I think it was around like six or seven <coughs> when the dinner rushes. Um, there was hardly any parking spots there. Well, thank you. thank you. Mary Care, South Kent Island. Um, listening to this very complicated and difficult discussion, this seemed like an appropriate time to remind the board that in the 2010 comp plan, there are two objectives that would have a tremendous effect on situations like this. One objective states that any traffic analyst would be hired by Queen Anne County, not by the developer. The developer would pay the fee, but the county would hire the analyst, hopefully, to have uh, uh, work. Uh, it's like an expert instead of trial. You know what the recommendation is going to be. And the second uh, objective is that we not use the generic formula for what traffic uh, uh, objectives are attained. We use a formula that is specific to Queen Anne's County because all of the different anomalies that are not anomalies that cause all of our particular problems. So your question about the east traffic would be uh, maybe delved into a little more deeply. So maybe I could, this, none of these have been codified. So maybe someone on the board would feel uh, interested in having it move to be codified. So when the next traffic problem comes up, those two objectives from the comp plan are in place. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? 
Okay, I'm going to repeat myself. If there's anyone else from the public who wants to speak and there's an empty chair next to the speaker, come up and sit in it while they're speaking so we can keep moving. So if anyone wants to speak besides Ms. Fordansky, come on up and sit down. <coughs> Yeah, Sorry. Caught the handle. Carol Ken Island. Uh, I'm extremely concerned about all the traffic issues that you brought up. Uh, one of the things, since um, Mary Care brought it up, was that I want to remind you that, as we are well aware, that comp plan has the face, has the uh, the force of law in this county, and it should, it needs to be obeyed. The other thing is that I believe that. Uh, McDonald's would not be placing that uh, restaurant right across the street from its, uh, right across Route 8, uh, Route 50 from its other restaurant if they weren't expecting a tremendous influx of traffic from the Bay Bridge, uh, especially during the hours uh, on, on the weekends uh, in, the, in the summertime. And I really under don't understand why only one of the times that they did any study at all was during that period. And it, that should have been the one when most of the studies were done, and the other ones to just to kind of compare. You could have done one on the out, outside of that time, but that, that seems like a very poor way to have run a traffic study. And I think you ought to take that into consideration when you consider how valid it is. Thank you. Well, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> um, well, first. I'm the uh, who you are, bro. okay. I'm Jerry Gimelstab. I'm the proposed owner of the new McDonald's. Um, so first of all, uh, as I said to you last time, you know, I've always looked at myself as someone owning a restaurant and it happens to be called McDonald's. And I do, regardless of what some people may say, think of myself as a small business person. And, and I think it's important people understand my wife and I, who is here, we started with one McDonald's 25 years ago in Annapolis. And then slowly, we built up our business. And after, I believe it was five years, I think we had our second one. And then I think it was another two, three years we had our third. So, you know, I don't make any apologies for my wife and I busting our tail over the last 25 years to build up to where we would have eight, eight McDonald's restaurants. Now, I don't make any apologies for that. I would think that is what people go into business for, really work hard and try to accomplish. So I don't make any apologies for that. And I think uh, that's what the American thing uh, way is. And I would think, especially on the Eastern Shore, people would appreciate that. So I just want to get that out of the way because that sort of bothered me, that whole attitude. As far as this restaurant is concerned, you know, I don't know from my perspective, and I'm a, you know, I've been uh, hearing this the whole time, I don't know from my perspective what more I could do or uh, anyone else could do. When I look at it, one, the State Highway Commission, not somebody McDonald's has hired, the State Highway Commission has said that that circle is adequate. I understand that and I understand some local people thinks it may need improvement. And if it does, then you know that's something we should all work towards to improving it. But the fact is, the State Highway Commission, not McDonald's, not a McDonald's traffic study, the State Highway Commission has said that circle is fine. Matter of fact, they said it's an A level. Two, the parking meets all of the zoning issues that you, the council, has given to McDonald's to meet their criteria. So the parking McDonald's took care of. The design of the building, I think everybody here was overwhelmingly like, blown away on how much the design of the building looked good. We uh, tweaked the design to really make it look uh, good. I don't think there was any issue on the design of the building. It meets all of the zoning requirements. I mean, I appreciate all the people who live behind the shopping center. But the fact of the matter is, it's a McDonald's in a shopping center on Route 50. My God, if that doesn't make sense, I mean, I have no idea. It's not like we're putting it in the middle of a school area in a community. It's a, in a strip center on Route 50. So, you know that. As far as people talking about uh, danger, this or that, if you look at the State Highway Commission, could I continue? We're Just for one minute? We're gonna have to ask you okay, to all right. And uh, thank you. Well, there may be questions. 
Okay, I appreciate it. Anyone else from the public? Okay. We're going to close public comment. Um, what's that? You're going, to have, you're going to get some booze if you ask them to come back at it. Oh, well. Specific questions. I, I would agree. Oh, booze. I, um, well, the question now is, is whether we want to um, ask specific questions of anybody, any of you, or whether we want to give the applicant an opportunity to respond to some of the things that were said. Um, I think if we just need to ask questions of the people that we have questions for. I, I think it's important that as we ask questions that we don't get in a tit-for-tat conversation. Um, we are here to, to glean information. We are here to make a decision. But let's not try to overemphasize our point and make sure that we're, we're just trying to one-up the conversation. Um, all of this testimony is very valuable. It's been very good information, but I think um, there's a lot of emotion floating around the room, and I think it's best if we leave that somewhere else. I, I would agree. I, I had a couple specific questions. Um, was traffic, this is for the, the traffic consultant, was traffic from the cloister subdivision proposed traffic that would be coming from that subdivision once built? Is that included in your study? Yes, sir. That's one of the background developments. Okay. That was an easy one. Um, there were a couple comments about vehicles entering the circle at high speed. I'm just wondering, is it physically possible for a tractor trailer to make a 90 degree turn at a high rate of speed? I mean, I understand things could happen. Somebody could come across the median, but, but to, I'm just wondering whether that's physically possible to to do that no well mr chairman not, perhaps not off of 50 but coming from behind the food absolutely, line, absolutely. That's, that wasn't they certainly was. could come into the circle at a higher speed than off of 50 from either of the other two directions absolutely. i just in any roundabout in the well, state of maryland if i can respond to that, since uh, i think we're, i was going to make the comment I, no this, we're not going to we're not going to go there we're not going to go there okay um, unless someone has a comment for you we're just going to, to ask those specific questions that anybody has okay what else anybody else have any questions for anybody uh i've got a couple um the parking studies that were done for the and i don't know yeah the, the parking studies that were done for the proposed mcdonald's uh, did you take into account that shopping center and if you did did you take into account the food line shopping center also yes we did uh when we do the parking study we took into account the entire shopping center we went out there and did a physical count of each individual parking space and does does that matter that that the food line is not considered part of that shopping center uh no we take into account you know how food line actually has 192 reserved spaces uh there are excess parking spaces in the shopping center uh, there's some underutilized parking spaces towards the rear of the shopping center, but in all there are excess spaces. So in, in today's in today's standard, if that shopping center was being built today, the number of parking spaces in it right now is adequate for today's standards? Yes, sir. According to the county zoning regulations. Actually, the R's Americantina requires 18 more spaces than the McDonald's would. Right. If you consider the shopping center park. But when you, when, if this goes through, the parking spaces that will be with the new McDonald's will be more or less than what's existing there right now. That that will be affected. My point being, when ours, if ours, is demolished and a McDonald's is built right now, there's X amount of parking spaces around ours. Are they losing or gaining parking spaces by putting a McDonald's? We are in? losing 13 spaces to put a McDonald's in. But there's 18 less required, so. If you look at it, you know, count-wise, uh, we, we are gaining five spaces because McDonald's requires less Based parking. Based on the size of the McDonald's and Correct. the amount and of the size of our American Tina. And, and then my last question for you, uh, a point was brought up when you come off that circle, you've got to go west on the access road and then turn left to go into McDonald's. Correct. The distance between the circle and that entrance uh, how many cars could sit there in a queue? And my, my next question would be, would it be advantageous to move that entrance further west 
to get into the shopping center. Well, that's more of a traffic issue, but the traffic entering the shopping center is typically not delayed by any means of anyone leaving the shopping center would have to wait for the oncoming traffic to come in. So you wouldn't have any traffic queuing going into the shopping center typically. Queuing usually is involved coming out of the shopping center. Except that we know that traffic did queue at the other McDonald's out on the street. And, and, the, and the circle being there. I, was talking, I, was just, I'm, I don't know because the site plan doesn't really show how far that entrance is from the circle. So I'm just thinking if worst case scenario, there's 70 cars an hour coming out of that McDonald's and waiting on Saturday and Sunday because of all the people coming out of uh, the Cracker Barrel and the gas stations. And then they start having to wait. Are they going to be blocking that entrance? I don't know how, what the distance is there, how many cars can sit in that line to wait to get into the traffic circle before they block the entrance. Now you're stopping people from getting into the McDonald's, and that starts to build up. That's only, you know, I mean. I mean, the numbers that I'm looking at, peak hour Saturday, turning into the shopping center entrance by McDonald's with 79 vehicles, including our impact. Opposed by, they have to yield to the trip. Well, no, that's not right, because you told me that, that the, the trip was, the highest peak was 274 that could be added. That's in and out. So half okay. of that so is in and out. And, and we'll that's that. at that McDonald's. Right? Correct. And I'm going to assume, worst case scenario, at this McDonald's. 100. Say 100. And, and assume 150. So Opposed yeah. by seven, 279 through vehicles. That's the only person they have to yield to. So if somebody coming this way, they have to yield to 279 people coming this way. I haven't done a queuing analysis here because this is a critical lane analysis, but I've been doing this for 30 years. There is not a queuing problem out on that service road to turn into this shopping center. Um, rule of thumb is one foot for every vehicle per hour for a left turn. Mm -hmm. The 150 foot would be a very maximum queue, and I don't think you're going to get anywhere near that here. I don't know what the distance is between the two intersections, but. It's nothing that I can see with these numbers to tell me that there's going to be that kind of queuing problem. Okay. Other questions? Mr. Chairman, yeah. I want to clarify something. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's to make things more consistent, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I want the question answered accurately for you. In regards to, you were asked the question about if they deduct out if they were to deduct out the food line spaces, that the site is still adequate and it's overparked, is that right? Correct. Okay, but you would have to do some striping. Yeah, striping would have to occur. And striping, we have proposed striping in the, the site plan. Right. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Okay, you can get down there. Okay. Yeah. Chris, I, I got one question for you. Yeah, just, just to clarify, our zoning code and the way the plan was put together has a, a parking standard for a regional shopping center. The, the issue that's being brought up is the proximity of parking spaces to a specific use. Our zoning code looks at the entire property, the, a regional shopping center is a shopping center over 100,000 square feet, and there's a specific parking standard for that looking at the entire property, and that's how the, how the parking calculations were put together. The issues we're hearing is proximity of parking to specific uses. Well, while you're there, uh, I'd just like to clarify the issue of, of the comp plan versus a McDonald's there. Is there any weight to that? Is there any, is, is that an actual factor? I mean, I, I was under the impression that this was a redevelopment of an existing site, and this is a, this is a uh, approved use. It, it, the, the, um, the zoning of the property is consistent with the comp plan. The permitted uses in the zoning of the property are consistent with the comp plan. Okay. Um, a, 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 a fast food restaurant in an urban commercial zoning district is a permitted use. Chris, I have a question on the standard. Uh, several, several people commented on, on traffic increase. What, what is the standard? that we're looking at? Is it traffic increase or is it the adequacy of the intersections? I mean, we got, we got a real disconnect here between the public telling us that the situation there now is terrible and it will only be worse, and we got the experts and State Highway telling us that things operate 
operates fine and will operate fine. And I, I'm, I'm having trouble with where is the standard that we're supposed to apply. It's not, I understand, it's not public opinion. I understand that. No. But there's got to be some standard. The standard is whether you, as a matter of fact, based upon the evidence that has been presented to you, can find that there is, that approving the site plan will not be detrimental to health, safety, or welfare, or you make a finding of fact that if improved as proposed by the site plan, there is as a matter of fact, not of opinion, as a matter of fact, a decided danger to health, safety, or welfare by virtue of the construction of the project as proposed by the site plan. Period. <coughs> Calling that it has to be this project, that you're looking at this project creating health, safety, or welfare concerns. If they already exist, then you have to take that into account and determine that this project is creating, in addition to what's already there, some unique health, safety, or welfare concern that justifies a denial as a matter of fact. As a matter of fact? As a matter of fact. <laughs> that, that's a standard for site plan approval. Um, the APFO standard is really a capacity standard and, and the straightforward right. calculation. That's right. Of, what of the APFO what the technical uh, review committee may have decided as to adequacy does not necessarily mean that you can find as a matter of fact that there isn't some distinct safety problem that this use proposes uh, or this use will produce. Expand on what you mean by matter of fact. I mean, we have, how, how, what's, what makes that a matter of fact? Based upon what you've heard, if you find that the facts support, that it, and it is not an arbitrary or capricious decision, which means opinion, um, that there's been sufficient evidence jet produced to say that this use will create a safety hazard or will otherwise be deleterious to health or safety or welfare, then you could find that the site plan shouldn't be approved. Undoubtedly, uh, you know, there, I can tell you that there will be appeals, of course, on both sides, and then the question is whether you've acted arbitrary capriciously, whether there's quote-unquote substantial evidence to justify approval or denial. Generally speaking, matters of opinion are considered oftentimes not probative when making findings of fact. Okay. Unless there are other questions. We I have one additional question, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cahoon, if the McDonald's, which is an assembly use, according to our current zoning codes, were a standalone facility, not within a strip mall, um, how many parking spaces would they be required to have and how many are they short in their existing condition? Um, well, their, their existing condition considers all the parking in the entire shopping center. So that's going to be, um, they're going to be adequate in their existing condition. The, it's the proximity of those spaces, you know, we're looking at the entire property. Um, I, offhand, I, I don't have that number of, it, it's one unit per, or one, I believe it's one space for either 50 or 100 square feet for a standalone fast food restaurant. Um, Thank you. Okay, so we either need a motion to approve or disapprove, or we need to give someone some instruction to something else. I have to say I am uh, absent of my original um, Paperwork. I am as well. Me too. Would you and like to borrow mine? Pardon me? Would you like to borrow mine? I would. I'm glad you're uh, more prepared than I am. Yeah. 
remember, uh, particularly in this circumstance, that we should not stray from our um, commitment um, to making um, findings of fact. Correct. <laughs> Rather than just one way or the other. And, and what's the... Um, Steve is working on parking. Um, what's the uh, what's the time frame for getting this approved? If we didn't do it today, is there a clock ticking on this? We can look at it next month. Pardon me. Yes. Mr. Howard, did you just wish to review? Well, I, I'm, I'm thinking about all the public testimony we've had um, and wondering if, uh, I, I don't know if any new information is going to come in. We've heard from uh, experts on the uh, state highway about safety <coughs> and traffic flow. We've heard from the traffic people on how everything works, uh, the traffic study people on how everything works as it should and will continue to work as it should even after further development happens in that area. But, you know, I don't live in that area and so it's easy for me just to take what the facts are and I don't have to drive through that intersection every day. I do drive through that intersection and I have to say I've never had a problem going through that intersection. Um, I probably go through that intersection once a week. Um, but that's not saying what everyone has testified to isn't true because I have my own issues at the north end of the county with traffic that I sometimes run into that no one else does. But when I look at the facts, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't allow a McDonald's there. Um, and so, but I do want to make sure that the facts and the findings are accurate um, if I would make a motion. So, I'm going to try to wing this. I move that the Planning Commission regarding the request of the McDonald's USA LLC, Lee May for minor site plan approval to replace the existing 8,642 square foot commercial building with a new 4,140 square foot restaurant with a drive through in Stevensville is more particularly described in the Department of Planning and Zoning file 041301 0005-C and find that the proposal um, there's a study approved in January of 2013 finding that all public facilities would be adequate to support the redevelopment of the pad site the current zoning district permits 40% floor area. The subject property um, will permit up to 8.57 acres. The existing FAR is 2.86 acres. The existing 8,642 foot square building will be demolished and the new building of 4,140 square feet will be constructed. The resulting FAR will be 2.76 acres or 13% floor area. The proposed would be serviced by existing public sewer and water. The parking required for the proposed use is covered via the code under 181-83C shopping center. The requirement parking, the required number of parking spaces is 482 and there are 507 spaces provided. I would like to include something about the traffic study um, can you help me with that, with some language, saying that the traffic study showed that the uh, intersections were adequate and will remain adequate even after the development happens? After the, after the McDonald's is constructed and all background... Um, Construction... All is, background yeah. projects considered are constructed. That is exactly what I wanted to say. And hereby grants approval subject to the following conditions. The buildings constructed must be substantially consistent with the architectural drawings and elevations provided for approval 
except for any minor revisions will be reviewed by staff as may be necessary. All remaining edits and or documents required by the Department of Public Works are reviewed and approved. Any remaining edits or documents required by the Department of Planning and Zoning be re reviewed and approved. Any required legal documents must be approved, signed or recorded. Any required shores, bonds, reviewed and inspection fees must be submitted to the Department of Public Works and the Department of Planning and Zoning as appropriate and all required signatures must be obtained. Is there a second? A second. I, I'd like to make an amendment. I'd like to see that uh, McDonald's, the owners of this McDonald's, uh, make every effort to work out some kind of an agreement with the Postal Service to put their vehicles behind the shopping center. I mean, I think that, I think that that's one thing that c could alleviate some parking issues. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, I, I don't know if we can tell you to spend money, but if they say they just need a fenced in area back there that they're worried about security, but by moving all those uh, postal vehicles to the back of that shopping center, uh, I think is a, uh, a plus for that McDonald's. Guess I need a second for that amendment, right? that okay Luke uh, well I'm not sure that the McDonald's people can right I, I'm not comfortable with your amendment I understand what you're saying and, right. and it, it, it's it's a nice thought but my dealings with the federal government is sometimes it's fine well it's the hard. federal government can say no um, I just want right yeah just make an effort that's all <coughs> I, I'm still not comfortable with it Okay. Is there anyone else wants a second that proposal? Which one? Oh. Jim's proposal to amend it to suggest they make an effort to make an effort to move those vehicles out of that shopping center to give them more space. I, I will say, Jim, that I think an effort needs to be made for that to happen. I just don't think it should fall on the responsibility of the McDonald's owner. I think it should fall in a bigger responsibility. And I think it would be more effective if it fell on a bigger responsibility. And I don't want to get us off on a, on a side conversation about how to deal with the Postal Service. But um, I just think it's, it's a bigger problem. But I think the applicant was fine with at least trying. I, I can represent without it being in the motion that I will speak to the, the owner of the center, if that's what uh, Mr. Howard is referring to. And you, you have the owner of the McDonald's right here. Well, I think the, the, the owner of the center is the only person who might be able to accomplish that. But I also think the owner of the center should be chastised for the way this whole thing has come down. Mm -hmm. okay? This has been made, we've been made to be the bad guys here because the owner let this go on while the other business is operating and, and it's become, um, to some extent, uh, save ours versus let McDonald's come in. And that's, I, I would like to do that. But I don't think that that's an appropriate thing for us to have been put in that position. So I, I'm just going to state that and leave it at that. Stan. I might point out that uh, we have received complaints over the years about the, um, the uh, post office vehicles in the parking lot um, from other tenants and so on. Um, and we looked into seeing whether or not the parking of those vehicles overnight and um, was somehow contrary to the zoning code, like outdoor storage that's not permitted. Um, we can't find, and by we I mean planning and zoning, have not been able to find anything in the code that prohibits the parking of those vehicles in the parking lot overnight. Though we recognize, I think it's fair to say, we recognize that that really is not what's intended for a shopping center parking lot. Um, so I would, Jim, I agree that the owner of the shopping center, um, and this has been going on for a number of years, the owner of the shopping center um, has been somewhat um, laissez-faire with the post office uh, about that issue, and it, and I, I agree that it should be brought to light again, and there's, I don't understand why those vehicles can't go behind the shopping center. Well, if, we, if, we, if we're going to leave it out, I just... 
I'll yes. make that representation to the board that I'll speak to the landlord. Okay. So we have Luke's motion on the table, is, and, and it has been second. Any mm -hmm. other discussion on that motion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstain. Motion is four. Okay. That's a majority. Uh, the motion carries. Thank you, board members. Okay. Next on our agenda is uh, major site plan. Chairman Waterman, could we take a five-minute break? Okay. We are going to take five. Five-minute break. Three zero four zero 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 one dash C Joe the Grinder LLC Dunkin' Donuts right yes Dunkin' Donuts um, Holly go right ahead okay last month when this was before you for site plan approval the consensus was that the architecture needed some improvements uh, just a few updates we'll extra special touch so the applicant came in and met with staff and we spent some time in a conference call with their architect going over various different uh, ideas that would help to improve it and I will turn it over to the applicant to do their presentation on their architecturals and we you should have those in your packet you can take that one the front page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was the article in the front page about last month's meeting in the Bay Times. I figured oh, really? oh, I was going to teach you I'll just turn it over to Todd and to Joe, who worked with staff for the past month. And you know, uh, it was a short time frame and a short turnaround. And then they can go over the elements and what was done. And, and hopefully, it's something that you all find close to your satisfaction. Certainly, uh, open to any comments that you might have in regards to the architecture. Right. Yeah, yeah, I'm the owner of Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, we started in 2004, Ken Island. We're at the uh, back side. I mean, I'm, I'm pr pretty sure all you guys are familiar with the project, right? Um, we're in the back side of the Ken Island Shopping Center. Um, we we have a short and a problematic traffic situation there with our drive through backing out into the road and whatnot. So we, of course, we, we're just coming back here for the architecture. I, I don't come up with the architecture. They present us with the prototypical <coughs> design that we're supposed to put forward. You know, and obviously in different uh, municipalities, some of that doesn't work. So um, what we try to do since the last time we met here was get together with, with, uh, with Nancy and Holly and try to go over what, you know, the eastern shore vernacular is a little ambiguous for us, so to try and figure out, you know, what that really looks like, um, you know, because there's a lot of different architectural styles on Ken Island that probably you don't want represented, you know, in our new building. Um, so anyways, we came up with the design. Joe Kelly worked with it, um, L2M Architects. You know, to try and incorporate some of the finishes, exterior elements that would be more um, more compatible, you know, so that we do a nice project here. You know, I've got to pay for it, so I'd like to look at something that I enjoy too, you know, not just uh, some prototypical design that doesn't really, isn't that pleasing. So hopefully what you find um, <clears throat> is a little bit more pleasing. I don't have a copy of the last uh, project proposal. Probably just as well. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I don't really have a comparison for you today, but I do have what Joe brought with, with us. And uh, if you guys would like to, okay. if you want to put it on, sure. take yeah. a look at it. Now, this is just a, uh, a site plan that we've provided because, uh, as I understood it, there was some uh, mislabeling of the elevations. So this is to help clarify what direction uh, you're viewing the building at. The next slide i have is the old design the old prototype dunkin donuts and that's just for reference here so that we can look at the changes that we've made with the design and here's a uh, elevation of the new design for the dunkin donuts uh, some of the elements that have been changed uh, most notably 
are we uh, clearly defined some of the customer entrances with the use of uh, false gables, um, giving them a distinctive roof form. We raised uh, parapets to help screen the HVAC equipment from public view. Um, dimensional cornice treatments have been provided. Uh, we have uh, used a brick veneer for uh, added that to the exterior, including the uh, water table, soldier header courses, uh, corbelled brick below the water table. Um, We've incorporated uh, standing seam metal roof, uh, fascias, and rakes at the gable ends. Uh, we've incorporated divide light windows, uh, gooseneck light fixtures above the windows and awnings, and the uh, there will be outdoor patio seating area. Um, the other uh, bulk of the exterior facade will be used, uh, will use synthetic wood siding in a complementary paint color. So overall, the design, uh, we've, we've incorporated some change in plane, change in texture, material elevation, uh, along with the addition of the gable ends, divided windows, cornice spaces, and rake treatments, uh, provide some architectural character that avoids the monotone feature that the original design <coughs> sort of uh, exuded and those are the highlighted changes for the building and then we have uh, four rendered uh, elevations uh, from each corner of the lot so here's a view of the building from the uh, the site entrance can I make a suggestion that isn't necessarily just for this Dunkin Donuts but Joe and Perry and I don't know if yeah, Barry Griffiths one. here um, when we get these uh, pretty pictures, um, they they often show uh, nothing in the background, except here we have blue sky. And for example, I think what we'd be looking at behind this picture would be the Bank of America. I think the rear of it, probably the right. rear. It would be nice to put that put these pretty pictures in context, so you'd have some sense of what's around them. Not just for this. I'm not saying this is that's fatal. I'm just saying in the future it might be nice to know what's around them. Okay. Sorry. Right. We have to get a kid to see We have the, a view here from uh, Route 50. A little close up from Route 50, but uh, really probably off of uh, Shopping Center Road. Uh, this is the view from the drive aisle at the uh, drive-through. And the view from uh, the corner of the, the Dunkin' Donuts parking lot. What's the excrescence to the right? I'm sorry, the, the refrigerator? Uh, yeah, the, the walk -in. walk in box. Is that what it is? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Any questions for the applicants? We're strictly I, dealing with the. Uh, I, I, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> um, you know, I, it, huge improvement. Nice, nice. You know, I, I'm still not a fan of your orange awnings, but I realize that's probably a signature thing, but it's nice. Yeah, thanks. I, I have to tell you that when the article came out, my son came into me and says, What the heck are you talking about? You can't have orange. <laughs> Dunkin' Donuts and orange, they're the same thing. <laughs> But I, too, appreciate it. I, I, I think it's a much more attractive design than, than you had before. Um, <clears throat> any other questions for the applicant? Any comment from the public? You guys, one or another, we could make room for the public to comment. What I say is not going to be a surprise to anybody. <laughs> 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 to a brief history of the uh, design standards that first appeared in the Chester Stevensville Community Plan. Um, as we lo as the citizens that made that plan lost what they wanted in Allendale, lost what they wanted in Cloisters, lost what they hoped to get at Camp Matter Farm, we always patted our, each other on the back and said, well, thank God, at least we have design standards. We don't have design standards. That does not meet our design standards. 
and standards have the weight of law. They're not guidelines, they're not suggestions. Every developer that comes in here and feels that they can get away without meeting the design standards, the next project you get is worse. Uh, McDonald's design, stand, design is, is terrible. You're not supposed to have a flat roof. Really? Um, I recently said to a resident of Centerville that they had a fairly decent McDonald's. Uh, and I did not understand why we had to end up with the, I'm sorry, I'm going to hurt somebody's feelings, that monstrosity across Route 50. And the one we're getting now is not going to be much better. But I asked the resident of Centerville, how, you, how come you have a fairly graceful building with the nice slope roofs and, and we end up with what we end up with? And the response from that resident was, our planning commission is fierce about our design standards. Why can't we be a little more fierce about ours? Thank you. Anyone else from the public? Those public comments. Holly, what do our design standards say about roofs? We'll wait. I don't have the booklet in front of me. Do you have the booklet? Mm -hmm. um, Steve, I might need some help here. Um, this is this is one of the things we've we are struggling with. The design standards are. Here you go. Yes. Got it. Yep. Got it. Sixteen. The design standards relate to a lot of large development and not specifically to infill or redevelopment of this type. It's one of the things we're struggling with and at this uh, past Monday's planning staff meeting, we uh, decided to devote ourselves uh, in earnest to coming up with the, uh, I guess a, a booklet of sorts with pictures kind of like what Gibson's Gantt grant provided but we'd be doing this uh, basically for countywide use provided by the county that we could hand to any applicant and say this is what we're looking for the colors uh, you know, street lights uh, outdoor seating uh, you name it everything I, I think we already have a lot of information we have been provided by some of the developments that we have approved that the Planning Commission did like. We also have things like the Chester Community, uh, Chester, Chester Stephenville Community Plan, which has some information in it, as well as the Kent Narrows Community Plan, which has a lot of information in it. And there are projects there that have started to come in underneath those design standards and implementing the lighting and the, the sidewalks and that kind of thing and pulling it together slowly but surely. With regards to roofs, it says specifically pitched roofs and gables are encouraged. Where pitched roofs are not practical from an engineering basis, false gables and mansers can achieve a similar appearance. Flat roofs with exposed mechanical fixtures are prohibited. Yes, and this goes back to several discussions the Planning Commission has had um, specifically in relation to restaurants. Restaurants where they have a lot of mechanical equipment on the roof, vents, um, <laughs> flat roofs are where they place that mechanical equipment and either through elevating the wall height to screen that, um, putting in different um, architectural features, um, that's what has been accepted over time for those types of restaurant uses. Other uses where um, you don't have the same thing, like um, the highs, as an example, they came in and they had a pitched roof, some of the shopping centers, um, um, but the, the drive-through uh, restaurant facilities, 
they put their mechanical equipment on the top. It's part of their operation, how they function, and part of it, it's... So we've had these discussions in dealing with it, back to the Chick-fil-A, um, back to the other McDonald's, um, you know, and, and we have accepted the flat roofs, recognizing that that's where the mechanical equipment goes for those types of, uh, of uses. How wide is this building? What about the McDonald's in Centerville? What about the 7-Eleven in Centerville? Explain that. I'm not going to explain the McDonald's in Centerville. I didn't review it. I wasn't part of it. Yeah. It's in the incorporated town of Centerville. It is in the incorporated town. They have a false mansard, and they, they enclose the equipment within the solid. From, from just thrown out there. Uh, I, I would like to maintain some order. I'd like to add one more thing in here that I'd like to read out. Uh, parapets concealing flat roofs and rooftop equipment such as HVAC units from public view are appropriate. Parapets shall feature three-dimensional cornice treat, tr treatment and should be the primary means of screening rooftop equipment. Yeah. Um, so how wide the It's 40 at the back and 50 at the front. Excuse me. <laughs> um, you know, here we have an example of using this type of feature like we've used on several of the restaurants. You know, flat roof, but you break it up with some of the pitch. Um, it, it's not uh, what we have seen is a large number of um, with restaurants. This is where we've seen these. The first, the first flat roof, we're going back several um, years to when. We were really pushing for pitched roofs, and then a flat roof came in. Was um, the bank in the shopping center right near the Dunkin' Donuts? And when that bank came in, there was a presentation of, of um, architectural features throughout the area that had a flat roof and had different trim features or something else that um, and went to the town of Centerville and went to other places, pointing to architectural features with a flat roof. At that time. Um, you know, the Planning Commission reviewed that and accepted that as a as a specific feature on that building. Um, then as they've come back with uh, restaurants or other uses, we've we've re reviewed them and looked at them. You'll remember with the CVS, um, there was issues about architecture and, and entrances and trying to put different features on different ends of the building. We had those discussions uh, relating to them. Okay. Any other questions? No, is the applicant coming back? The applicant's right there. We can ask him anything we want. A thousand times improved. But I want to know, is this the prettiest Dunkin' Donuts in America? <laughs> I want to know. I want this to be attractive to the franchise. I want everybody on my island to think it's beautiful. And I say that because when I get bored, <laughs> I look at pictures. Can, may I approach? Feel free. You got a projector there. Oh, I don't know if I want to put my phone up there. Depends on what kind of picture you're showing. <laughs> <laughs> Dunkin' Donuts. Look how pretty that looks. Wow. Where's that? I don't know. I just did a Google. It's on our phone. It's got a flat roof. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> but it's pretty, isn't it? Yeah. I want this Dunkin' Donuts on my island to be the prettiest one in America. Ours is better looking than that, though. It's here, go. Good job. It's very Holly. pretty. Really? That's a fresh I don't think that's pretty. That's, yeah, that's the fresh one. Oh, just laugh. It looks, it's I don't think, pretty. really, it doesn't. What about the big box on the top of it? It's no, well, I mean, that's just, it's just the lighting, it's a little details on it, not necessarily the box. And that's also the compact <laughs> day before this one to sit down a little bit. I just want this to be the prettiest one. It's in St. Petersburg, Florida. How do you know that? Uh, corporate construction guys here. <laughs> I want your franchise to visit our Dunkin' Donuts and say it's the prettiest one. It's a good looking Dunkin' Donuts. Um, I, uh, for those who weren't on the Planning Commission years ago, when we developed these design guideline uh, standards, excuse me, um, Ms. Kerr and I were probably the uh, design Nazis. Um, 
and um, I agree with Mary that there has been some drift from where we might have been some years ago. Uh, but there is a fine line. Um, Mary probably remembers we were shown pictures, I don't remember by whom, of some McDonald's in um, New England primarily, as I recall, that apparently they're economically successful, but they don't look anything like what we perceive to be a McDonald's. Uh, they were very consistent with the architecture in the towns in which they were found in New England. So I, I think one of the but things... Th I, because, I gather there's a fine line right, between and, that and... and I, I know what McDonald's... I, rem I remember seeing the McDonald's, and I think it was in Freeport, Maine, and you know, it looks like a house, and you know, it looks like one of those ship owner houses. I mean, it's, it just really was, was very, very nice. But one of the things we have to remember um, as we evaluate these things is, you know, there's an old building here now mm -hmm. that's, you know, in my opinion, a little unattractive. This, I think, is a huge improvement. Mm -hmm. And so as we discuss um, design standards, and to keep Mary's comments uh, in, in order, when we're doing new developments, I think it's really important that we're, we're hard-nosed with our design standards, that we, you know, we, we make it exactly as it needs to be. Here we have something that's improving. Um, and we certainly have seen a, a thousand percent improvement on this building from last month. Now, whether that was planned that way, so we're all excited about the thousand percent improvement, um, I don't know, but I hope not. Um, but we are improving the look of the area with this building as it is now. I would agree. I agree. Yeah. Well, a zero Definitely. times a thousand is still a zero, but... Um. <laughs> You just can't resist. <laughs> no, uh, uh, we took a lot. No, uh, that was perhaps, you know, more. If I could restate my earlier comment of let's not try to one up each other. <laughs> well, uh, that means, my point is that, that, that we, my point is there is a fine line between, you know, uh, uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder and allowing people to do with their property with what they want to do. Uh, however, we have been uh, shown over the years that notwithstanding the franchisee or the corporate box that it goes elsewhere, the franchisee and or the corporation of these franchises will make major changes when pushed. That's all. And Right. This, this is an ongoing discussion, and we'll be back to you in August. Um, as Holly uh, discussed internally, we're looking at a variety of options and resources we can bring back to the Planning Commission and back to the table um, to provide to applicants in the future um, to get a better result. So th this, this will be back uh, in August, and uh, we'll continue this discussion. Some of that discussion might might need to be the language that's used. There's a world there between encouraged and required. Mm -hmm. It's and, it's and the if language, if it's the expectation. If we other word, then we need to use that other word. Yeah, uh, it, it's the language, it's the expectation, it's the examples we, we reference, um, and that's what the future materials will contain. And it's truly the distinction between the types of development. It's, 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 it's you, there's much more flexibility when, when you start with a, a clean plot palette and you come in with a new shopping center development. That's what I found in working with, including franchisees and corporates. Okay. Once again, I don't have my paperwork from last month. Hmm? You did yours? Okay. All right. Resolve that the Planning Commission regarding the request by Joe the Grinder, LLC, Todd. Butcher that up, honey. La Lumiere. La Lumiere. For minor site plan approval to replace an existing 3,756 square foot restaurant with a new 3,500 square foot restaurant with drive through in Chester, at, with drive through and as more particularly described in Department of Planning and Zoning file MISP number 04 13 04 0001 C, hereby finds. The maximum building height permitted is 45 feet, and the proposed structure is to, is to be a maximum of 21.6.
Stormwater management will be provided on site via ESD practices and is fully described on sheet five of nine. The site also meets the 10% reduction as mandated by the critical area. Map LU-5 current generalized zoning areas mixed use for the comprehensive plan. And for the Chester Stevensville community plan, map 2-4 Chester existing land use commercial. And hereby grants approval subject to the following conditions. One, the buildings constructed, constructed must be substantially consistent with the architectural drawings and elevations provided for approval, except that any minor revisions will be reviewed by staff as, as, be, as may be necessary. And we're talking about today's plans. Uh, any remaining edits and or documents required by the Department of Public Works be reviewed and approved. Any remaining edits and or documents required by the Department of Planning and Zoning be reviewed and approved. Any required legal documents must be approved, signed, and recorded. Any required bonds, sureties, review, and inspection fees must be submitted to the Department of Public Works and the Department of Planning and Zoning as appropriate, and all required signatures must be obtained. Second. Any discussion? I just want to clarify everything. Nothing changed, with, like, with regard to the height or anything, did it? No. So it's all factually. The site plan's the same, too. No other discussion? Okay, we have a motion to second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When will it be open? Before the end of the year. Thank you. Okay, next on our agenda Thanks. is uh, Thank you. a work session on comprehensive plan implementation. We have to make a decision, Planning Commission, on whether we're going to handle this today or whether we're going to defer it. I, I would recommend that we defer it based on the uh, time of the day that it is. I would also recommend that um, I think this is the second or third time we've deferred this work session. And while I feel it's important that we have this discussion, um, it might be better served on a special meeting. And I'm just throwing that out there. The last thing I really want to do is come in for another meeting, but it seems like it keeps getting postponed, so I wanted to... Well, to I think we'll, had we planned to have lunch today and, and have an agenda beyond that, we would have had plenty of time. Okay. We just didn't plan for that. Yep. Um, I, I would like to say, um, assuming that everyone else is in agreement, that they would like to defer that. What I would like to do, because I know there are some people here to comment on this, I think we should take their public comment let them say whatever they want to say, and then we will um, adjourn the meeting after that. But I do want to say up front that we have, um, if you all haven't looked at your emails, you have a pile of emails that came in today saying, don't change the comp plan. This is not a discussion about changing the comp plan. This is an ongoing discussion that's been going on for well over a year about how do we implement the comp plan that we have. The comp plan has lots and lots of goals and recommendations in it. Some promote growth. Some say we should restrict growth. Some of them are directly in contradiction with each other. We then, uh, we passed that plan in, in 2010, and then the state passed the Sustainable Growth Act, um, the uh, uh, Plan Maryland stuff, lots and lots of things have happened which will absolutely prevent us from implementing very important parts of the comp plan. So this discussion is about how do we implement what we have left in our comp plan and how do we deal with those sections that say we should do A and the state says you can't do it anymore. So that is what this discussion is about. We are not planning to change the comp plan. Um, so that said, anyone from the public that would like to comment on this topic at this time, you're welcome to come up and do so. Uh, this will be on our agenda next month. Um, and so you're welcome to speak now, speak then, or speak both. Mr. Chairman, if anyone does make comment, can we have pretty copious if you don't plan on coming back, Ms. Kerr, Mr. Storr, um, transcripty, that detailed sort of um, well, a I, record made of their comments? They'll be on tape, and we'll be able to review that if need be. If we need to transcribe something from that, that's, I mean, that's an extra step that I, mean, I can see Barbara's not very excited about. But I, I think we should not. I didn't turn around when I asked. I think we should not worry about that until we decide if we need to worry about that. Um, we may. When we come back and to they this. Could be back. Yes. Go right ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Nicholas Storr from Chester. <clears throat> Your opening comments were actually helpful. Um, uh, there is a perception from looking at Helen Spinelli's 7.1 page email that doesn't anywhere near begin to convey the points that you just ticked off. And I'm not sure that using Helen's um, uh, email 
as or memo is a sufficient basis for a discussion. And maybe it needs a broader uh, write-up of talking about some of the legislative constraints that have been enacted since the comp plan, but it needs uh, a more thoughtful um, think piece uh, uh, for a full and open discussion about uh, what it, what you think, what you think the barriers are, and um, <coughs> and and how those barriers can be better managed. Um, my comments are based on um, uh, a year and a half that I spent on the resource uh, conservation and environmental protection topic committee that helped develop it was one of six topic committees that helped led up to the development of the 2010 uh, comp plan. So I'm not working, not flying blind here. Um, so when I read Helen's email, um, it, it it comes across as uh, a very stark, um, basically, uh, way around uh, the comp plan as opposed to something that would be strengthen it or make it more useful uh, and be more consistent with what the 300 citizens who made up the various um, uh, topic committees had in mind when, and, and the Citizens Advisory Committee that was sort of an umbrella organization over that. And so um, maybe some type of a review of where that citizen involvement was um, and, and where it came out would be a useful preamble uh, to help the people, to help the members of the planning commission have a. So, you, so when you talk about a potential a, a second meeting, um, instead of just leaving it up to the public with three-minute uh, windows, and yourselves, um, maybe it calls for a a broader discussion on all of these points, um, and maybe the structure of a standard monthly planning commission meeting is not the right environment to tackle those issues. That's flying, I'm flying blind quickly here because I just saw that the memo, I think on Monday night or yesterday, Tuesday I guess it was. That's my quick quick reaction to it. 10 seconds. Okay. Um, uh, I, I, I want to I defend right Ms. Well, Finelli. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, but just to clarify, the Planning Commission requested that we go back and put some ideas on the table. The next step, if there was a direction to move in based on one of those ideas, it would be to go out, prepare full staff reports, provide in-depth information like we would do for any other text amendment or any other proposal specific to a direction and guidance given by the Planning Commission. So this was not a, here's a list of things we're going to come back and all, of, and all of a sudden it's going to get done. It's, here's some ideas to start a discussion. If we move in a direction, then we would come back and have those specific detailed discussions about any one of those topics. Mm -hmm. And it may be that those topics are not the appropriate ones now. It may be other ones. but. You know, the Planning Commission asked that we go back and come back with some ideas, and that's what this was about. Um, I, and and I mean, Helen... Nor were these out of the blue. We have had mm -hmm. detailed, lengthy discussions over the last year and a half about almost all of these things. So th this is not something that is, should be a surprise. Right. And, I, and I don't want the memo... Uh, Helen's job is dealing with long-range planning, dealing with the comp plan, and dealing with the text amendments. And um, she did what she was asked, and and this is a starting point um, from where our discussions have led us. Um, it wasn't meant as a as a um, it, it was meant for a discussion and some put some options on. It. I just want to support Steve's statements. That's exactly the way I remember this. Mm -hmm. I remember being very involved in this discussion, and we wanted to identify a few points to start with. And we wanted to get some guidance as a commission, and then we, we were going to start the process of discussing some of these things. And that's all this memo was about, is starting to discuss some of these things, not changing the comp plan. We were just trying to figure out how to implement the comp plan, and these are some starting points. Um, staff, and, and it, it, I don't think anyone is leading us down a road that we weren't asking to be led down, um, and we want to we want to kind of reevaluate where we are and then have some starting points of how we could 
help the county accomplish the comprehensive plan. Ditto. And Mr. Storr, now that you have this, um, you know we are always available to accept anything that you would like to submit. And if you submit things to us in advance, I know most of us, if not all of us, will certainly take it into consideration. So <coughs> you have the exact same memo that we do and ditto everything that Mr. Cahoon said. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Kerr. Yes, uh, Barry, I agree with you. There are a lot of inconsistencies in the comp plan. In fact, there are even a few contradictions in the comp plan, and I think that they need to be looked at. They are not on this list. Um, I could not take any of these suggested changes and link it with an actual objective in the comp plan and say that it is strengthening the comp plan. It's weakening it. Uh, and I, I really like Nick's idea of getting together with, the, with you and with maybe some people that had direct involvement in the comp plan, like Frank Fromm, and I would even say myself, I was on the planning commission during the time it was put together. Um, you need someone, I think, with historical memory uh, in terms of where we want to go with this. Um, I'll just give you two examples when it talks about the TDRs. When the Blue Ribbon Panel talked about TDRs, they talked about actually creating a new town. Here we have TDRs impacting Kent Island, which was definitely not accepted. Uh, that's a major, major factor. It, it, it isn't fair to all the people that work so hard, and I certainly include Helen in this, in terms of putting this comp plan together, to be limited to three minutes of comment. There are very strong feelings out there, and people want a chance to express them, to have a dialogue, and to exchange thoughts and ideas. So I would really, uh, it would be really nice to have that kind of workshop. Could you expand on that TDR comment? I, I'm trying to understand what you were replying or implying about, you said the TDRs in a new town? Yes, when, uh, when we had this discussion about farmers retaining their equity in their land and using the TDRs to do that, uh, it was pretty much accepted that Ken Island could not absorb all the new houses that would be involved for the TDRs. And the suggestion was, and it was accepted by the Blue Ribbon Panel, that we think in terms of actually designating in the county a new area that would be the place that would receive the TDRs. Well, with that being said, now, now that you know that we can only build where we have sewer and water, would that have altered your thinking? I mean, we, we can't do the new town anymore without putting a new sewage treatment plant in. Well, then there was this, the discussion about uh, not not talking about the uh, present sewer plan uh, on the bay, uh -huh. but to talk about having uh, individual sewer capacities that would serve 13 houses, and to suggest it like that. But to brainstorm mm -hmm. and think about it, and not have a, a comp plan that says, Kent Island is not appropriate for intense development, and then turn around and say, we're going to send all our TDRs to to Ken Island. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, um, one of many conflicts because that whole concept of creating a new town was destroyed by the state's actions. So we don't have that part of our comp plan that's well, possible anymore. So those are the things we'll welcome your input as mm -hmm. we move through this process to try to figure out what do we want to be now that the state has changed the parameters of what we can be. Okay, and I, I for one don't understand that all the state things, and I would appreciate an uh, opportunity to have a dialogue about that so I understand specifically how the new state regs impact our ability, if that would be possible. It, it actually has taken place. I don't know which I was, meeting it was, was but we had a pretty good um, um, presentation by staff on the impacts of the Sustainable Growth Act which specifically was the issue. We also invited MDE here uh, and had them specifically talk to us about the proposed uh, growth offset plans, which their draft recommendation said that there would be no, um, uh, basically you couldn't have any new kind of spray irrigation or anything else. 
So, so those things have taken place. They certainly, uh, expansion of those and, and reiteration of those things will be part of whatever process we have going through. But we, we have been stalled in, in an inability to implement major parts of our comp plan because of the avalanche of, of state regulations that have come down. And now we just have to think about what, what do we do? Presentations are great. I don't think they're as constructive as dialogue. Sure. Okay. Thank you and very I much. And I would just like to state that we also, um, in those meetings, have talked about opening up uh, meetings that the public and other people would come in. So we have said that for a couple months. I want to just remind people. Okay. Any other? So, Suzanne Hogan, Stevensville. Um, I would like to... Um, reiterate my or state my support for what I think both Nick and Mary has suggested about um, these particular conversations going forward. Um, I think everyone remembers the vote uh, in November of last year when um, county residents clearly indicated that they want to protect the APFO. Um, I mean, uh, two of these seven deal directly with APFO and the way it's implemented in the county uh, as the chair of the APFO ballot committee. I would definitely like to see that that it was a highly visible um, and very open dialogue um, around any modifications to APFO as they are uh, implemented in the county. So I think it would be in the citizens and in the uh, local government's best interest. Thanks. Thank you. Any other public comment on this topic? Okay. Um, that leaves us with uh, miscellaneous staff items. miscellaneous staff item I have um, that we haven't discussed already was the um, submission of a petition to the Department of Planning and Zoning which is kind of unique the petition is actually requesting the Planning Commission to consider an amendment to the comp plan it's a citizen petition submitted to the department um, we haven't had these types of or we haven't had a petition uh, like this before the Planning Commission is the only entity, and it's entirely within the purview of the Planning Commission to decide if and when any type of comp plan amendment would be opened up or, or um, whether you would move forward with anything. Um, all comp plan amendments or comp plan revisions emanate from the Planning Commission. Um, that being said, um, the petition was provided to this department and, and given to the Planning Commission because the property owner feels that the current um, land use designations and land use decisions um, have put them in a place where their only remedy is to request this amendment. Um, and this, uh, this relates to Chester Haven Beach. and. It, is, it was submitted um, by Mr. Foster, who's here today, and on behalf of Howard Brown. It's the Howard Brown property, which is adjacent to Gibson's Grant. It's on the east side of Gibson's Grant. Um, I know that um, both uh, Mr. Foster and uh, I think Barry Griffith with Lane Engineering have signed up for press and public comment and wanted to speak to this matter. Um, and at this point, um, it has not been reviewed by staff or or legal counsel or had a conversation with them to, to put that through the review. I think um, at this point it would be something the Planning Commission could take under advisement that it's been submitted. Um, and then the next step would be for me to meet with counsel and to go through what to do with this and how to deal with it. Wouldn't it be more appropriate for us to tell you whether we have any interest in you doing that or not? Mm -hmm. I mean, no sense yes. in you going through any effort if there's no willingness of, of the part of the plan. Since the planning commission is the only people who can can institute this, just because someone has asked that, I think it's up to us to decide, do we want to bring this up as a topic so that the applicant can give us their whole thing and people who oppose it can tell us why we shouldn't do that and, and we either do or don't discuss how we might. Well, I think there's, there's 
I would want to be able to advise you on some logistics and procedural issues relating to that if in, in order for you guys to make your decision. And I think it would be appropriate to Chris weigh in on that too. But no, if you guys have reviewed it and have some comments or opinion on it, yes. I'd, well, we all know about it. I right, that's absolutely. About, about the extent. Right, and, and, and what, that's where we are. What, what I know right about now. it is that the owners, and, and at least I think the courts in the, in the past, have found that these are a whole bunch of lots of record. And when you indicate that their only option is to to come in with this petition, I, I suspect their other option is to try to develop the lots as they sit. I, they, they, and, their position is they feel that this is their only option. I'm not representing that. Right. That, well, as I say, if, if the lots are lots of record, then it is certainly possible they could develop them exactly as they sit, and that may or may not be a good thing. But uh, since, unless you have something else for miscellaneous stuff, they're the first two people signed up for uh, public comment. Let's give them their three minutes, and if, if something from that makes us say we do or don't have any interest in that, that's fine. Otherwise, we'll just deal with, you know, we'll just move on. Do we want to review first? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Michael Foster, attorney for the applicant. Barry Griffith, Lane Engineering. Um, just a comment first on procedure. Um, the Chester Haven Beach Partnership LLP, that is technically the owner um, of this property and has been the owner of the property since the 1950s, I believe, um, uh, when the subdivision was um, first filed a record in 1959. Um, procedurally, where do we stand with this before? I don't think it would be proper for us today to argue the merits of the petition, nor for you to consider the merits of the petition. Ironically, um, to let you know why we filed the petition, um, er ironically, uh, even though the subdivision plat uh, was recorded in 1959, it was recognized by your early predecessor, the first planning commission of Queen Anne's County. It was rec recognized that they were lots of record when we first had zoning in uh, 1962 and 1964. And it was issued a certificate of exemption signed by the planning commission saying these are lots of record. Um, in the course, because we have been involved with some litigation um, with uh, people that did not want to see any use of the property whatsoever, um, we can say that either the county or my client have received um, uh, written or verbal testimony from every director of the Department of Planning and Zoning who, and we've got some letters from them that they recognize these as lots of record. Um, we, because there are lots of record in the critical area ordinance, it says that if you have lots of record, and, and this property was designated RCA, it says one thing you should do is try to resubdivide those so you bring them into conformity insofar as practical. The 1959 plat doesn't meet anything in the critical areas, doesn't meet anything as far as far as conservation doesn't meet any requirements as far as sediment control so in order to bring that into um, conformity in order to re-subdivide um, we are we were in the growth area we were in the first uh, Chester growth area we were then taken out of the Stevensville Chester growth area, the most recent one, even though when they took us out and redrew the line from the east side of the property to the west side of the property, uh, stopping at Gibson's Grant, if you look at the plat, the county plat, when they said this is the growth area, our lots are set forth on that plat. I mean, they're, they're part of it. So um, how do we bring it into conformity in so far as practical just before you go any further we're going to we're going to give you six minutes because there's two of you we don't need the background okay all we need to know is why should we consider um putting this on our agenda that's all you got to get to is is do we have any interest in that and i don't think we're going to make a decision today but that's all we really need to hear from you not they, all of that stuff will come and, if and we ever think about and it and i totally agree i just wanted to for and, you maybe didn't have an opportunity to read the petition or 
um, I wanted to let you know why we're here, because it is an unusual thing. I think the only thing for this planning commission to decide is to look at the petition and to decide, do you want to hear us? Do you want us to give an opportunity to be heard? Because if you do, Mr. Cahoon is correct, that certainly the petition then has to be processed, which would require notifying public agencies, et cetera. Um, and we would probably not be able to get back here and make some presentation to you until at the earliest, I think we calculate would be the October planning commission. Um, so, but I think first, I think Barry, you're correct that it doesn't make a lot of sense for sending this out to other public agencies or to going through any of this unless you, the planning commission, because we as citizens do not have a right, unlike to request citizens' requests for rezoning or text amendments, we don't have a right to do that. 66B solely gives the right to the planning commission, but it gives an absolute right for adopting a comp plan and any revisions. And, and Mary also talked about inconsistencies. Well, we would suggest that this is one of the inconsistencies um, that we would hope that you would look at um, because... Okay. One thing to your point, Mr. Waterman, if, if, if it is agreed this is a grandfathered recorded subdivision, lots of record, which I think the courts have, have found to be true, the, the, the answer to your question is we can do a much better job as planners and engineers to design an environmentally sensitive subdivision here um, that works with critical area laws if we can get growth allocation. So we're not trying to develop under RCA conditions, but we can't get growth allocation if we're not in the growth area. If we can get public water, we, can't, we can do this on wells, but it should be on public water. There's, there's those types of considerations that unless we get in the growth area, we can't get there. We, we probably can develop it under, under the rules that exist today, but it's not going to be uh, uh, done the way that would be best for the surrounding community in Kent Island. And, and the county gave us allocation for the 186 lots. We have that sewer. allocation, I mean, sewer, excuse me, sewer allocation for the 186 lots. When they did do that, the commissioners did ask us that they would hope that we would not use those on the lots of record, that we would, in fact, had us make a presentation to the commissioners um, at the time, which Carol was one, that we would try to bring this into conformity insofar as practical. If we can't get it amended into the comp plan, the intent is to proceed and try to develop it. Uh, uh, my suggestion would be that you might some bullet points about why it would be better for the county for us to consider to bring this in so that we have the opportunity to review that um, better design all the all the things that you started to go into i think that that would be far preferable and that's all done so we can easily do that submit that to you okay thank you thank you any other public comment Motion to adjourn. So moved. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much for coming.